this meeting of the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support uh, Committee together uh, are to order. And if we can get a roll call, please. Arenas? Here. Jones? Mahan? Here. Jimenez? Present. Perales? Here. Going back to Jones. Okay, we have a quorum. Thank you very much. Okay, and now uh, we have review of our work plan. Uh, there's no items being suggested to be added, dropped, or deferred by staff. Any uh, recommendations from committee? All right, seeing none, um, we can move forward. We don't have anything on consent either. And uh, we do have uh, our first item, item D1, which is our fourth quarter financial reports for fiscal year 2020-2021. And I'll now turn it over to staff. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair Perales. Um, so I'm Julia Cooper, I'm the city's finance director. And today I have with me, um, Nikolai Skarlop, who's deputy director of treasury and debt management and Liz Kupersi Howe, who's the assistant director who is also covering uh, the vacancy we currently have in our revenue management division. So since this is the fourth quarter report, we decided we'd run through the entire slide deck with you to see how we ended the fiscal year related to our debt and investment program and also our revenue management program. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nikolai and then he will then pass it to Luz. Good afternoon, uh, council members. Uh, this is going to be a tale of uh, two cities, one where we celebrate low interest rates and one where we bemoan low interest rates. Uh, first, on the debt side, because interest rates remain near historic, historic lows, uh, the city is undertaking a lot of financing activity this uh, year, and particularly in the fourth quarter. As you can see on this chart, the dollar volume of bonds issued is approximately double of what it was in the last two years. But that isn't because we added a lot of debt, it's, uh, except for the housing area, it's primarily because of refinancing of bonds from prior years for savings. Excluding the city's conduit issuer bonds for multifamily housing, the city has about 3.8 billion of debt outstanding. And the key on this slide is uh, for the GO and financing authority, the, the green and blue areas, those are the primary areas where we fund city um, general infrastructure, red is the airport and purple is the legacy successor agency debt. As I mentioned, it's been an extremely busy quarter for the debt management team. Uh, fortunately, the team led by debt administrator Joe Gray added one team member at the beginning of the quarter who brings additional rating agency bank and investment banking experience. The team closed a 428 million airport bond refunding. The city achieved a net uh, present value savings uh, uh, of $148.7 million. And that's 31.4% of the refunded bonds. And just to put that in perspective, the city's debt policy prescribes a minimum savings of 3%. And again, we achieved 31.4% uh, savings. And the savings were structured in a way that they were targeted for relief as the airport recovers from the impacts of COVID, especially in those first two years. As you know from the detailed discussion we had at the June 22nd board meeting, disrupt, disruption in the energy market has placed strain on San Jose Clean Energy. And when it was clear that Clean Energy's $30 million line of credit with Barclays was going to be inadequate and unusable for their cash flow needs, the budget finance and city attorney's office worked with clean energy to quickly collaborate on a lower cost financing solution before the end of the year. And uh, that resulted in that $15 million CP. And you'll see more of coming uh, on subsequent pages of this slide deck. During the quarter, the team also prepared the 2021 trans the pre-fund employer retirement contributions and that closed July 1st. And during the quarter, the team prepared the second tranche of Measure T GO bonds that sold uh, in July. 
They also prepared the lease revenue bonds for the fire department training center and central service yard. They'll be coming to council in September. In conjunction with the GAO bonds, the city received the very exciting news that in addition to having ratings of AA1 for Moody's and AA plus from S&P, which are each the second highest rating possible, Fitch raised the city's GAO rating to AAA, the highest uh, rating possible, reflecting strong legal underpinnings of the bonds and the underlying strength of the city's credit. In addition to the trans, the GO bonds and the fire training center debt that I mentioned, uh, for this upcoming quarter, the city also has multifamily housing revenue bonds coming in October. The city has a number of credit facilities that it's working on renewing. Earlier this calendar year, the city selected various municipal advisors for each of these uh, transactions from the advisory pool through a competitive process and selected PFM financial advisors to help coordinate e each of these credit facilities. At the August 31st council meeting, we expect to bring action items on the city's two commercial paper programs and work is continuing in the exploration of pension obligation bonds. We uh, received an information memo on that uh, earlier today. Staff made a presentation to the federated board and on September 9th, there will be a similar presentation to the police and fire board. And on September 21st, staff will return to council for consideration of the POB judicial validation documents that were originally scheduled for June 29th. And then on September 30th, there'll be a joint study session among the council and the two boards to discuss the various roles of the parties uh, in proceeding with POBs if any are selected. In this quarter, the city is also working on potential refinancing of the city's 2011 Convention Center expansion project uh, bonds for debt service savings. The city currently has an RFP out to select a municipal advisor and then we'll select the rest of the bond team. Last year, the rating agency S&P lowered the outlook for the entire hospitality sector to negative and has been addressing each rating since then. And uh, unfortunately, they lowered the, the city's special hotel tax bonds from A plus to A, and they, those bonds still have a negative outlook. If we proceed with refunding, savings on this program could be quite significant, and the city has received unsolicited analyses reflecting savings of from 30 to 40 percent of the refunded bond. The city will also be preparing for a potential bond for the regional wastewater facility to be issued early next summer. Uh, that will be a new structure and will require some time. And there are also uh, quite important administrative tasks uh, list, listed below. On the next page, you see that rates currently are near historic lows, uh, uh, lowest levels in the past uh, decade. Uh, and then again, this was great news for the GO bonds that we just sold in July and for our upcoming lease revenue bonds for the fire training center. Variable rates are also uh, extremely low, like the ones that we pay for credit facilities and commercial paper uh, with LIBOR rates under 10 basis points. The city continues to enjoy strong, stable rating. And again, we were very excited that the GO bonds earned the highest possible rating uh, from Fitch this summer. To put the ratings in perspective, we've compared them with the state and the county, as you might expect, uh, given the overlap. Uh, our ratings are quite similar to the county and are higher than the state. Last August, the rating on the airport's bonds were lowered from stable to negative. Uh, good news during this past quarter was that in April, in conjunction with our bond issue, S&P revised the outlook back to stable. And by the way, just this August, uh, in the current quarter, Fitch did the same thing. Clearly, the COVID situation has created a difficult environment for all hotel tax and travel related revenues. And in April, Moody's published a report specifically on 
uh, various hotel tax bonds, including ours, and, and provide uh, the market assurance that we would be making our debt service payment after discussions with the city. Uh, but uh, in August, as I already noted, s and did lower uh, our rate. So these next few pages just very quickly summarize the bonds that have been sold. Uh, just very briefly, you can see that the interest rates are quite low, 2.38% for our city hall of funding that produced net present value savings of $47 million. For the ICE Center uh, in October, 3.32%, um, again, uh, extremely low uh, interest rates. And then finally, uh, the airport revenue bonds that we discussed, we provide more detail an all-in true interest cost of 2.68% that helped us produce uh, the uh, net present value savings of $148 million in today's money or uh, over the electric bonds, $188 million. And again, that's over 31% uh, of the refunded debt. And that concludes the, the debt report. And I'll turn next to the investment management report. As you know, the city has an investment policy adopted by council, which constrains the investments uh, that can be um, uh, used for the investment pool. This policy is reviewed annually uh, and again adopted by council. The goals of that program are primarily safety, liquidity, and yield last. Uh, and of course, we uh, prepare quarterly reports on that program, and uh, those uh, full details are, are uh, posted as well for this quarter. That policy includes a social responsibility section uh, with important goals, and as you may recall, last February, as, that, as part of that annual report, uh, uh, we added further uh, constraints uh, on uh, fossil fuel investments. So this is what the portfolio looks like at the end of the quarter, $2.2 billion, a yield of in excess of 1%, our average maturity of 565 days, uh, producing fiscal year net earnings of in excess of $30 million. And there were no exceptions to the city's investment policy during this quarter. <clears throat> The next slide uh, simply shows you the uh, mix of investments that are used in that portfolio. The next slide uh, uh, attributes those funds to each of the various city funds, including the general fund, uh, of which 620 million uh, are part of that pool. It's important to note that one of the dynamics this year has been the receipt of federal dollars, which are great news in terms of the uh, growth of the pool and the, the new funds that have been received. Of course, because of those large infusions of cash uh, that are invested this quarter, they have the effect of diluting uh, the yield on the pool because again, uh, the good news of low rates on our borrowing uh, side is not so great news for our investment side. Um, this um, slide helps to demonstrate that the usual pattern of receipt of funds has been disrupted uh, this year because of those federal funds. So we've been investing differently over the course of the year. Slide 29 shows our, our yields and uh, compares those with late, the state investment pool, as well as the VAML index. And as you can see, as rates have gone down, and particularly as all pools uh, have bonds refunded uh, within their, their pools, as, as new investments are made, the yields have gone down. As you can see, 
our yields compare favorably to the safe uh, pools uh, yields, um, but all uh, yields are trending down. We continue to manage the pool with an emphasis on liquidity and safety and matching uh, those investments to expenditures. I add uh, the uh, finance team uh, successfully recruited a new uh, principal investment officer as we reported during our last meeting. Uh, our uh, investment officer uh, took a position as a finance director with another city on the peninsula. Uh, but we're very excited to have recruited and experienced a new principal investment officer who will begin next month. And the team, uh, fortunately, we have a deep team uh, that has been managing well in the interim. We do expect to return to council uh, later in the year to discuss uh, uh, the investment policies and potential additions to the pool. Uh, we expect to do that in consultation with our new principal investment officer. I would expect to uh, do that in February uh, as part of the annual review process. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to uh, Luz for the Revenue Management Report. Good afternoon, Chairman Perales, council members and the public. Luis Cafresi Howe, Assistant Director of Finance for the City. This is our fourth quarter revenue management report, closing out fiscal year 2020 21, which ended on June 30th. Next slide, please. So, to provide you some context, the revenue management unit within the City Finance Department has four primary collections programs focusing on general citywide accounts receivable, business tax collections compliance monitoring, which includes our revenue audit function for sources such as sales and hotel taxes and utility billing. Collections can take time. They can take, uh, the efforts can span several reporting periods. Given that, we report our collections numbers when we have the respective funds actually in hand. Next slide, please. This pie chart will give you an idea of our revenue management units overall portfolio. This is based on FY 2019-2020 budgeted revenues. This slide will be updated in our next quarterly report. In 2019-2020, the city expected total revenues of a little over $4 billion. Of that $4 billion, the Revenue Management Unit within Finance is responsible for the collections efforts of about $1.2 million, or roughly 40%. Next slide, please. This slide represents invoicing and payments five years history from FY 2015-16 to FY 2019-20. Once again, this will be updated next quarter. Um, invoices billed through the business tax system, invoices are billed through our centralized accounts receivable system and the utility billing system. So we have three billing systems that we use primarily in the city for citywide invoicing. The bar chart reflects the trend of invoicing and payments collections over the past five fiscal years. And the red line represents the percentage paid collection of the amounts invoiced. Next slide, please. This rep slide represents three years of outstanding receivables. Both current and delinquent receivables are on this slide, with delinquent receivables, which are accounts that are 91 plus days in arrears were presented by the gray fill, current receivables represented by the blue fill, and the delinquency percentage change from quarter to quarter represented by the red line. A point to make about this slide is you can see the peak in the third and a little bit of the fourth quarter of 2020. Collections were paused from March 17, 2020 to the end of May 2020. And as many of you remember, we uh, got a COVID-19 shelter in place order issued on March 17th. So we needed that time from March 17th, 2020 to the end of May, 2020 to take what is essentially somewhat paper-based system to a remote system. So we put systems during that time, we put systems and protocols into place to perform this collections work remotely. 
and the uh, revenue management sub uh, unit subsequently restarted collections activities on June 1st, 2020. So comparing the fourth quarter that just ended to the prior quarter, the third fiscal quarter, total receivables increased 8.9% versus the prior quarter, going from 57.2 million to 62.2 million. The current portion of those receivables increased 19.3% versus the third quarter from 15.2 to 18.1 million. Delinquent receivables increased 5.1% from 42, uh, 42 million in the third quarter to 44.1 million in the fourth quarter. And as you can see, the result of all those increases is reflected in the delinquency percentage change rising from quarter three to quarter four. Next slide, please. Um, this pie chart represents just the delinquent receivables broken down by where they are in their collection status. The majority of accounts, as you can see, which is a dark blue, the 23.9, are with internal staff. Those are accounts that are actively managed and pursued, collections are pursued by our staff internally. With the balance of the delinquent and receivables either assigned to a collection agency in payment plans, in legal action, or liens, and others, we do have some pending write-offs. Next slide. Please, uh, this graph demonstrates revenues management's return on investment or ROI, which was 5.6 for the quarter. That's the fourth fiscal quarter of 2021 compared to the target of 5.5. So in other words, for every single dollar that the city spent performing collections, the unit collected $5.5 in the fourth fiscal quarter. For the year ending June 30th, 2021, the revenue management return on investment was 6.5. That's $6.5 earned for every dollar invested. So next slide, please. Let's talk about a little, a little bit about the uh, expansion of an exemption uh, that the city council approved last year in 2020. So on September 29, 2020, the city council approved an expansion of the business tax financial hardship exemptions. Um, this, uh, prior to the council September action, the exemption was limited to small businesses with a certain income or, or who met certain financial hardship criteria. The expansion of the exemption was to then any business owner, if the financial hardship criteria was met. So it was just no longer limited to small business owners. So for the fourth quarter of, uh, 2021, um, excuse uh, fiscal year 2020 to 2021, 7,800 businesses and residential landlords with renewals due were notified about the expended COVID-19 assistance. Of those over 7,800 businesses, 727 applied for an exemption, 306 were approved, 33 were denied, 352 are pending, and 36 were duplicate requests. For the quarter, there's an estimated loss of revenue associated with exemptions for the fourth quarter of 128,000, a little bit over 128,000. Next slide, please. So for the three, three quarter period, that's from October 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021, 19,544 businesses and residential landlords with renewals due have been contacted about the available COVID-19 assistance. Of those 22,290 20, 2, applied, 1430 were approved, 195 denied, 577 pending, and we are working on those because each of those requires an individual review of all the submittals, all the income submittals and documentations that each business and or residential landlord will, will provide. 78 were duplicate requests and 10 were invalid accounts. So for all COVID-19 business tax assistance financial hardship exemptions through June 30th, 2021, for the three of uh, for the nine month period of the program, there's an estimated loss of revenue of a little bit over four hundred thousand dollars. To be precise, four hundred nine thousand dollars and four hundred nine one twenty seven. So we did say uh, the last time we talked to you, last time we did a quarterly report that we would be re reviewing the need for a continued relief beyond September thirtieth, twenty twenty one. The September twenty ninth, twenty twenty memorandum posited 
that estimate an estimated of upwards 6,000 businesses would be eligible with an estimated revenue impact for the fiscal year just ending of about a million dollars. And then a, a re estimated revenue impact for the first quarter of 2022 of about 350,000. So for looking at an application rate of how many people applied versus so far versus how, how many people have been notified so far for the three for the nine months, it's about 11% of the people that we've informed about this and about 40% of the re of the revenue that we expected to to real to um, lose. Um, given that at, at this point, staff is not recommending an extension of the exemption. There was a relatively low response to the program. And of course, we await council's direction uh, and or questions on this matter. Uh, next slide, please. So in summary, we are have the following recommendation to council. Accept the fourth quarter financial reports for fiscal year 2020-21 for the following programs, debt management, investment management, and revenue management, and then refer the fourth quarter financial reports for fiscal year 2020-21 to, to the September 14, 2021 City Council meeting for full adoption. And with that, we all are ready for your questions at your pleasure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, before we turn it over to my colleagues, uh, I'll turn it over for public comment. And just as a reminder, if you're watching on uh, YouTube or uh, the TV channel, uh, you'll have to head over to our Zoom meeting for public comment, or you can call in at 408-638-0968 to speak by phone. Um, and um, if you're here joining us by Zoom, you can uh, use the raise hand function. And uh, we'll take public comment now uh, on item D1, which is the fourth quarter financial reports for fiscal year 2020-2021. And our first speaker is Tessa Woodmanson. Good, thank you. You, you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, we okay, can hear yeah. you. Okay, good, thank you so much. Yeah, um, I guess uh, I was going to quote something from George Monbiot because he was talking about our climate crisis, which is what we really should be talking about all the time, this crisis. But I will connect it to our financials. I will, I promise. But basically what I was saying is that we need to re realign our, our, our decisions of what we're doing to save mankind and all of life on earth, like as if that's not a big issue. So, okay, that's where we're, that's where we're at right now. You know, we're at the end game, like my scientist husband says. So getting back to the financials, uh, the financials are one concern I had was that you were reducing your fossil fuel investments. Uh, I didn't like that word of reducing. They need to be eliminated completely. We need to <clears throat> disinvest from fossil fuels completely, it, you know, because all of the problems we're experiencing are because of our climate crisis. And so we have to disinvest, that's one. And um, so that was something. And then also in terms of the, the um, our, our funding, um, the way our Google, the Google money is coming into the city and it was in the, the, um, the uh, our, our rules in open government, which is BS because it was not open. It didn't explain what was on the agenda. It just showed us a picture of it. It went page one, page two. So that was like the BS. So I guess you have to read your agenda so you know what you're talking about because you're not going to discuss it. You're not going to uh, you know, reveal it. And so what the problem that I see is that a lot of the Google money that was um, you know, given to the community is now going into our general fund for economic development. That is wrong. We need to degrowth. And so what I'm saying the money needs to go to, it turns out the 3 million is the perfect amount that I need for my community to be resilient, which is to, to create a demonstration project to grow food in at 615 Stockton Avenue so we do not get a hotel and we send the, the message that we are degrowing and we are putting our money where our mouth is. You can't eat money and you can't drink uh, diesel. Okay, next up is Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, thank you for that uh, uh, breakdown of the financial uh, viability of the, of the city as well as its uh, obligations. Um, $6.5 earned for everyone, right on. Excellent, excellent. Um, I have some questions, though, with regard to equity, and I think that this is uh, one department where we as a city can start really um, doing work around that, like, like 
my question is to to the people uh, to give the presentations. Do you have a framework of equity with respect to your investments? Do 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 you have a a, a guideline, anything like that related to equity from the city to guide your decisions? That's one question. The other question is that the uh, I'm in agreement of not extending the uh, the uh, tax exemptions for the businesses and the landlords. Um, this is uh, it's it, it's cool. They, they they've received their help, and also that the uh, it was interesting to hear the uh, senora state that she said it in the same sentence. She said delinquency. Be, due to redlining, what it means is that when you redline something, it's something that is owed. So when we talk about redlining, what we're talking about is something that is owed. That's equity. That's how you define it. It's very simple. What's hard and difficult for, especially with respect to finances, is that we don't want to do that. There's, there's, this, there's this just stubbornness. But I would like the equity question answered. Also, uh, multi-housing revenue bonds. I'd like to hear what the definition of multi-housing revenue bonds is and what, ex what type of application, what, what does that mean concretely within the community? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. A few thoughts on our fourth quarter practices. Our May public budget meetings offered, we have been building up our police infrastructure considerably over the past few years, as have many other Bay Area cities over the past few years. I thank you that uh, from this, cities like San Jose and Oakland are now, starting, are now starting to more openly question how to more grow and develop ideas of equity, reimagine, and health and human services. And that actually, these can be the better ways on how to prepare for upcoming possible Bay Area natural disasters in the next two to five to 10 years. I thank you that you have figured how to work towards pay raises of city government workers in this difficult era, era of COVID-19. These are the ideas and practices that can be shared across the Bay Area at this time and can be of much help in the questions of VTA, HCU, labor and healthcare negotiations at this time as well. Please learn how we can all be more open and constructive and practical with massive new state and federal subsidy programs for local areas and projects. Let's figure our hopes and good ideals at this time. Interestingly, our better ideals of renewable energy, equity, reimagine, open public policies and open democracy at this time can more easily return us to familiar, regular good practices in case of difficult emergency situations of this next decade. Uh, Thank you for this time. Uh, actually, with 45 seconds, I have uh, time for a few more words. Uh, to also note, um, Tessa has simply been doing a great job the past few months. And, and what Paul Soto and myself have also been trying to ask for, for all the fourth quarter, how can uh, city government staff at their presentations of agenda items learn to offer more simple, basic information when appropriate? These are simple yet important ideas of how to build trust, openness, clarity, accountability, and better practices of a community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go back to the committee. Uh, first up, uh, Councilmember Mann. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to staff for the report. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'll be quick on this one, just a couple of quick questions. So one is, um, you know, given that the, the city and, and really the, the general fund are essentially a backstop for any unfunded liabilities related to retirement costs, I'm wondering if it, if it makes sense or if there's a reason that we don't cross-reference high-level financials from the retirement boards as part of our quarterly overall financial report. It just, it seems like it's hard for us to have a complete picture of the city's financial position without including that piece. Well, I mean, council member, the, the, the boards, I mean, they're independent boards and they have independent reporting relationships. So, I mean, I think it would be hard for us to do a cross-reference without then bringing the boards in to, and the staff in to respond to that. I know, Jennifer, correct me, I believe there are periodic times that the retirement staff does make presentations to the city council on their financials. They 
pre present their annual financial report, and then they also do uh, reports on their investments and the actuarial reports, if I recall correctly. Um, you're right. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're right, Julia. So the only one that comes to this committee, uh, council member, or the retirement plans investments annual report, and then that comes in December every year. The rest of them, I believe, just come straight to council. Yes. No. I've I've certainly received that report via council. It just seems to me that if this committee is focused on, in part, on the financial health of the city, and the city is the backstop for what is currently, you know, a few billion dollars that we're not sure how we're going to fund. And it's already a pretty significant impact on the general fund. I'm just, I'm just surprised that it isn't somehow part of the quarterly financial report because it is such a significant impact on the city's financial position. So I just, it would just, I would find it valuable to have the kind of holistic visibility, but um, I'll just, I guess, share that as feedback. Um, understanding that there's some logistical challenges because uh, they, they are largely independent, but they're not entirely independent. It's still, it's still on us to pay any uh, unfunded liabilities there. So. Yeah. And, and, I, and I can talk to um, Jim Shannon, the budget director, and see how that information might also be incorporated into the bi-monthly financial report that comes to the committee. So, so we'll meet and talk about that since we're now in the first quarter reporting period for the current fiscal year. So I'll talk to Jim. Okay. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. Don't want to create a bunch of extra work. It just feels mm -hmm. to me like it would be part of having the whole picture when we have this, this update and conversation. So thanks for that. And then the only other question I had was looking at that business tax relief that was the last update. I, I think I understand where staff's recommendation is coming from. But given that we are, as I understand it, focused on, on uh, businesses and, and small businesses and landlords. So I know one of the criteria there was businesses with gross receipts under $25,000, which is a pretty small business. And given that so few of them applied for the exemption, I'm just curious if we've tried spot checking with some of the ones who didn't apply and what, if anything, we know about all the businesses that didn't apply for an exemption. And are there, are there language barriers? Are there is there anything we could do to lower lower the barriers for those small businesses, for example, to access that relief? And I just I'm just curious how much we know about the very large set that did not apply for relief. What we could do, uh, Luz, thank you, uh, Councilmember Mann, for the question, Luz Cafresio. What we could do is work with OED because they've gotten some money to reach out specifically to small businesses and we could do some work with them. So I'd like some time if we could sort of a little bit of time to talk with OED and see how we could sort of um, marshal our resources and sure. we could do as far as reviewing uh, what else we could do to do some outreach. The program is continuing through September 30th, 2021. So only about six more weeks, five more, six more weeks. So. Okay. Sure, and I may not be suggesting something you haven't already thought of, and I, I, again, I trust that staff will figure out what the right ROI is in terms of staff time versus impact, but it is a little concerning that we've got a large number of these very small businesses and so few applied for relief, and it would, I would think if we haven't already, it would be really good to try to understand who hasn't applied and what do we know about why and are there ways we can lower barriers, so. Anyway, I'm just restating the point, but thank you. Appreciate you looking into that, and uh, Chair, those were my only two questions. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Vice Mayor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Julia, I know that you and your team have uh, turned over a lot of rocks to find, you know, reduction in expense and maximize our returns. But I guess I have a broad question, and that is, is there anything else left on the table that we can look at or explore or possibly um, restructure to um, create more savings or generate more revenue? Um, no, but, <laughs> no, but. Um, I, was I was expecting that answer, but I thought but, I'd ask but, anyway. But, but I would say that one of the projects that we do have on the plate right now is looking at the hotel tax bonds that were funded the expansion of the convention center. And um, there are economic savings to do that. Um, so we, you know, and obviously the hotel tax revenues are down significantly. So we're looking and exploring and options in terms of restructuring that debt. 
in, in terms of creating a lower cost of funds overall um, that then would help create you know more viability of that you know those revenues going forward so we anticipate bringing that forward to council sometime in the spring of 2022 so um, so that's probably the biggest thing that's on the plate but it won't necessarily have an immediate impact to the general fund because the general fund's not paying that debt service. However, if tax revenues continue to stay low, it could have an impact on the general fund related to paying the debt service. So it's important for us to bring that down. So it's thinking about it as a potential cost avoidance um, and as opposed to necessarily a, a revenue savings. So, but we continue to examine the portfolio and when, when opportunities arise, bring those back for refundings and restructurings. Okay, and then on the revenue side, I know that there's uh, quite a few restrictions in terms of uh, our investments, uh, you know, using public funds. Are there any uh, types of investments or uh, revenue vehicles that we're exploring or there's a possibility that we can explore to get higher returns? Yeah. Knowing, recognizing that we're very restricted. Yeah, we're, in, we're in this, you know, this box. Um, well, that's what we do. As Nikolai mentioned, we do have our new investment officer who's coming on board um, in a couple of months and one of, not a couple of months, a couple of weeks, middle of September. And um, one of his things that he'll be immediately tasked with is starting our internal annual review of our investment policy that we bring back to the committee in February. And so part of that will be looking to see, are we, does our, does our investment policy include all the things that we're permitted to do and can we you know enhance that policy to provide us some more options so we'll be taking a, a deep dive in that and you'll see that in february as part of the regular work plan great fantastic thank you julia i appreciate it thank you uh, next up council member Adenas. thank you chair um i had this the same um, question that uh, council member Mahan had around the small businesses. And um, I know that on the, on the resident side, on the community side, it's always, um, there's a lot more work to do to engage the hard to reach com um, community. And I imagine that it's true uh, for the businesses as well, especially the small businesses that are primarily um, immigrant, um, possibly first generation. Um, and so I wonder if maybe, I, I know that you said, uh, I, I know you said you were going to take it back and, and think about this a little bit further. I know that's going to end in September. I'd love to see it extend longer than September. And um, I think it would be wonderful to um, explore an option where we provide funding uh, to an agency, a community agency uh, that can monitor these funds for us and disperse them um, instead of having the city do it. Um, because I'm sure that they're in contact with a lot of these small businesses that probably have asked for help in the past or have asked questions and they probably keep a log of, uh, of all those folks. And, um, and, uh, and the city, you know, may also um, uh, be able to send letters home, but I think a call and some follow up is just going to take a lot more resources. I'd love to see this one. I'd love to see the program extended and and two um, have a different kind of approach so that we that it makes sense to small businesses. Is this something that's possible with what we have in place now? Um, and thank you, Council Member Arenas. Uh, one thing I wanted to be clear. The exemption is not going away. Um, two things I want to be clear about. The first thing, it, it will go back to what it was before, which was an existing financial hardship exemption for one low, re low revenue generating small businesses, which is two times the national poverty guidelines. Back then, it were the gross receipts, that measurement was gross receipts 25, uh, 25,520, or all business owners with limited household incomes. So that's four times the national poverty guidelines back then. Again, AGI was $51,040. So the exemption is not going away, but the expansion did was broaden it to any business that met the financial hardship criteria. That's one. And then two, the uh, these are not funds that we are dispersing. These are funds, these are basically revenues that we right. are collecting. Yeah. So I just yeah. wanted to be sure that was clear. Yeah. 
income. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is now. Yes, I, I forgotten <laughs> that. Of course, it's it's money that we're foregoing versus. Um, right. um, yeah, and I heard you say that you were going to um, pull in office uh, OED. So I think that's maybe another arm in, in which that we can maybe uh, use leverage their investments in some of our small businesses to to do some of that work on the ground for us. So I appreciate that. I, I think that's really all I wanted to add. Um, and, and thank you for keeping us afloat and more than afloat, a triple, triple A uh, status. Um, uh, and so I'm always very glad to hear um, in each of these quarters, um, every time it, the picture seems to look a little bit better. And so thank you so much uh, for all that work. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you as well. Um, Councilmember Mahan, did you have something you wanted to add? Super brief. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I wanted to add to Councilmember Reynos, and I think Vice Mayor also referenced this. I think um, we should all just take a moment to celebrate, once again, the awesome work you all have done on the, the refinancing, refunding, all the the, um, the cost savings there and the um, where we are with our with our ratings. I just I, I, I neglected to mention that, but um, there were some real bright spots in the report, and I just wanted to convey, I, I appreciate, I'm sure we all appreciate the hard work, and it's it really gives us more flexibility and the ability to, the, to deliver more services to residents. So thank you all for your work. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, yeah, I, I echo that as well. Um, certainly, um, you know, tremendous work that our staff is doing and uh, that's, you know, shown here in this report and obviously in, in our, our ratings, um, our returns. Um, and so just really, really appreciate the work of staff as well. Um, I had, a similar question and concern around the exemption, but I, I'm actually comfortable hearing that that is an exemption, a standard one that, that we we will continue to do, it, it, essentially not recommending the expansion of it. I, I'm comfortable with that as well. Um, and, um, and I don't have any other questions actually. Uh, so I'll just ask if I can entertain a motion. So moved. We have a motion and a second from Vice Mayor Jones. Um, and this is getting cross-reference, correct? Yes, uh, yes please. Yes, and the, so um, that's included with the motion, correct? Yes, to accept the report and cross-reference to council. Great, thank you. Uh, if we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Aye. Perales? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank All right, you. concludes that item. And we'll move on to item D2, which is our police department recruiting and hiring activity annual report. And um, let's see, here we have uh, Chief McFadden, uh, but I did wanna ask Ashley uh, staff, um, acting city manager, Jennifer McGuire, my understanding is there was a, a, a difference here between the posted and then the the, the staff memo, um, and so I want to make a clarification. If if you can, Jennifer, if you can clarify what the 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 difference is there, and then that we will make sure that we're speaking to and then moving the right item. Yes, th yes thank you very much, Chair Perales. Um, the posted agenda and the um, recommendation language and the recommendation language that is included in the memo are slightly different. Um, so we ask that as you consider the, the, as the committee considers this memo, that they consider the recommendation language that is on the memo, not on the agenda. We've had the attorney's office approval for you to do that since it's uh, very, very, very similar, but we did kind of reorder and uh, uh, clarify things on the written memo just to make it clear. So that would be our, our request as you consider this item. Okay, so it's just following the written language on the recommendation of the memo itself. Yes, thank you. Okay, which the memo is posted as well for the for public as well. Yes, it's been posted for the required time period. Okay, all right. So, and, and I appreciate that clarification. And now uh, I, I didn't see the chief, so I, I do believe it's the deputy chief that we have with us. Oh, no, I do see the chief there. Sorry, uh, Chief Mata is here. Um, so we'll turn it over to uh, him and his team. And Chief, your audio is not working. Nope. 
I mean, we see you talking and we see that your your audio is uh, showing that it's on, but we can't hear you. Still no go. Sorry, Chief. Yeah. Perhaps we I see can you got a, you got a couple of deputy chiefs on. I don't know if uh... <laughs> perhaps what? Chief Randall can kick it off. Good good afternoon, everyone. I'm Deputy Chief Heather Randall, Bureau of Administration, and today we're going to be re reporting out on our recruiting update. Um, Lieutenant Anaya has a PowerPoint presentation for you, and after we'll be here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council, Councilperson Perales, can you see me and uh, my slide? Yes, both, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Lieutenant Christina Anaya and I oversee the background unit as well as the recruiting unit for the San Jose Police Department. And I'm here today to present the San Jose Police Department's Recruitment and Hiring Activity Annual Report. I'm gonna start off with sworn applications. Um, as you can see from the graph, uh, for the last five fiscal years, uh, the applications were at a peak in fiscal year 17-18 and has slowly declined in the last three fiscal years. Uh, this fiscal year, 2021, was approximately 400 applications less than the prior fiscal year. But looking at fiscal year 2017 to 2018, which was clearly our highest number of applications received, this was the first year of increased funding for the recruiting unit and a push for larger academies. A lot, a lot of money in that fiscal year was allocated for recruiting to cover staff, travel, advertising, and overtimes, overtime, and the results were clear. Um, so moving on to the reasons why the reductions of the, why there's a reduction in applications. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic was in full effect the entire time, during this entire fiscal year, which is one of our primary reasons for the reduction in applications. This, this led to fewer in-person events and recruiting opportunities. The travel restrictions prevented us from recruiting out of state. Another reason is our contract with Civilian Incorporated, which was our advertising vendor, ended or expired in April of 21, which led to a, a big reduction in applications for the last nine weeks of the fiscal year. We are currently in the RFP planning stage to put the contract out for bid. Another reason is the social and political climate has recently portrayed the occupation of police officers as less than desirable, um, which has reduced our interest pool, especially after the death of George Floyd in May of 2020. A retirement eligibility is also one of the concerns. Uh, statistics show that officers across the country are retiring as soon as they're eligible versus staying on for better retirement benefits. And what I mean by that, I'll use San Jose tier one officers as an example. Officers earn 2.5% a year for, towards their retirement for their first 20 years. When they, in their 21st year, that um, goes up to 4% a year, making it uh, more lucrative to stay in the latter years of their employment. Um, but recently people are, as soon as they're eligible, they are just retiring at their, at their 25 years and age of 50. Um, the New York Times recently re reported on a survey of almost 200 police departments across the country that indicated retirements were up 45% and resignations were up 18% in the year from April 2020 to April 2021 when compared with the previous 12 months. And lastly, another reason that we are seeing officers leaving their eligible for retire or leaving early, they're leaving government jobs to go into the private sector, uh, Tesla, Apple, Amazon, and other private personal security firms. Staffing with sworn personnel in the department and the department fluctuates between authorized staffing numbers and the number of street ready officers. The department is currently budgeted for 1153 positions, but we are at 1160 filled, which indicates an extra seven personnel. However, of the 1160, 50 are in the FTO program, 75 are recruits in the academy, and 21 are on disability, 38 are on modified duty, and 14 officers are on other types of leave. So therefore the total number of street ready officers and what I mean by street ready is officers who could put on a uniform, get in a car and answer calls for service. So that total number uh, is 962 of street ready officers. 
Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk about some of our recruiting events. Um, as you can see from the slide, uh, uh, community events have been on hold. We have not attended any community events uh, for the entire fiscal year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we did most recently do our first in-person uh, job fair in Sacramento on June 10th, um, which, which was our first in, well, in-person job fair. So we did all our events this fiscal year virtually. So we attended or presented at 29 colleges and universities. We attended 51 career and job fairs, and we attended 10 military events. And we did, we did do some in person. And what that primarily that focuses on um, non affiliated academies, as well as South Bay Regional Academy in South San Jose. Um, what not what a non affiliated academy is, is when someone who wants to be in law enforcement and wants to make themselves a better candidate or, or have more um, qualities that law that police departments are looking for. They have there's several academies throughout the state that allow people to put themselves through at their own cost. So we at San Jose, at San Jose Police Department, we go to these academies while they're in, in, the, in the middle of the academies. We slate time with the, with the academy coordinators and we present to try and get the people who are putting themselves through the academy to come to San Jose when they graduate. Um, so we went to eight um, academies this year in person. And then I talked about South Bay Regional. That is um, another, it's also a police academy, but they host uh, the California State Written Test for police officers almost every other week, as well as physical agility tests. So what that is, is candidates have to have to pass the state test and they have to pass a physical agility test to get hired by any law enforcement agency in the state. So South Bay offers these, these tests at a fee. And what San Jose does is we go and present to the people taking the tests in advance of their test. Um, for this last year, we pretty much had priority because a lot of agencies were had hiring freezes and were not attending. So they accommodated us really well. Um, and we attended 54 presentations at South Bay. Um, but now recently in the last few presentations we've attended, uh, other law enforcement has also been there. So that's gonna cut into our, we kind of had the, you know, we had the inside scoop for a while, but now of course, with the other agencies rehiring and, and the restrictions for COVID lifting, we'll have a little more competition when we present there. Next slide. We're still focusing on our target audiences. Um, obviously, we, we look to those who've been pursuing a career in law enforcement. We're looking for people that have a personal alignment with our core values. We're focusing on diversity and women and athletes, uh, college students and graduates. We, we wanna look for candidates with a higher education. And we also focus on military personnel. Next slide. So the recruiting unit used an advertising vendor called Civilian Incorporated for the last five years until the contract expired in April of 2021. The overall cost for the, was approximately $611,000 for the duration of the contract. And we're currently working with the budget office and a new R, RFP to get, the, get it back out to bid so that we can get a new a new or, or the previous advertising vendor. Um, a little bit about Civilian and what they did for us. Civilian is a full service advertising agency. Um, when they won the bid in 2016, they came to us, we sat down and began the process of developing a media strategy. Uh, we explained what we needed, where our problems were with recruiting, the types of people we were looking for, obviously focusing on women and diversity, our budget and expressed the need for measurable, uh, for measurable results. So then civilian laid out their strategy and we went back and forth and then we agreed and then they implemented it. And civilian uses digital media versus traditional media. Uh, digital media is more wide reaching, is more cost effective. It caters to a tech savvy younger audience. It allows us to target specific, specific, sorry, specific groups based on their social media platforms and interests and it's measurable. For example, Civilian can track the number of clicks on a particular ad or on a particular website. They can track how long uh, a prospective candidate was on that website and if they applied. Um, this allows us to make improvements as we go along. And with Civilian, we also had the ability to flood a particular geographic region in advance of a, of a recruiting presentation or job fair. For example, pre-COVID, when we went out to John Jay in, in New York, Civilian saturated the social media in the geographic area uh, announcing our upcoming um, job fair. And we 
got a significant number of people based on that um, advanced advertising done by civilian. Um, and traditional media, just to show you the difference, is generally radio, TV, billboards, car wraps, bus wraps, et cetera. It's expensive, it's not measurable, and it can't target uh, groups or people. I mean, it's it's unlikely that most people are going to just drive down and see a billboard, San Jose PD hiring, and pick up their phone right away and call. Um, so the media strategy with civilian, what they did is they purchased media on behalf of San Jose PD from Facebook, Google, Indeed, Twitter, and others. And then they used this media to place ads across all platforms. So the more, the more a group or geographic region clicked on an ad, the more ads were sent. Um, and civilian knew what phrases and words to be most efficient for us, and cer certainly after five years of um, being in contract with us. Next slide. But the San Jose Police Department Recruiting Unit does have their own so social media platform, and it works consecutively with our advertising vendor. Uh, the biggest one is the newly launched and updated recruiting website, SJPD at U. Um, we also use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And we go across all these platforms to provide updates for job openings, testing dates, workshops, and fitness series dates, to name a, name a few. And on SJPDU, we advertise for all positions within the police department, sworn, um, police data specialists, communications, uh, call takers and dispatchers, as well as uh, CSOs. Next slide. So the San Jose Police Department's fitness series was is a free physical agility program that was started in April of 20. Applicants in various stages of the hiring process work with academy and recruiting staff to work on fitness and testing techniques. The workouts are hosted and ran by our TAC officers in the academy to simulate exactly what these candidates will experience when they're in the academy. We host this every Wednesday at the police substation and one Saturday a month, and, it is, and it's been very successful. In fact, and so during this last fiscal year, 2021, we hosted 42 sessions of, of fitness of the fitness series. Um, San Jose 41 is our most recent academy that began in June and we hired 32 recruits. This is a picture of Bureau of Administration Deputy Chief Heather Randall and 20 of the 32 newly hired recruits. And they, this is the last Wednesday before they started the academy, just to show the, uh, the participation level of the people that we're hiring. Next slide. This is a picture of our, of our recruiting unit as of June 30th of this year. As you can see, this unit is very diverse and represents four of the six race data ethnicities as defined by the US Department of Civil Rights. Additionally, the unit collectively speaks three languages and has three women. Next slide. We continue to focus on our, our recruiting efforts on colleges and universities with a high diversity rating according to collegefactual.com. We conducted 29 presentations at colleges during this fiscal year. The colleges listed on this slide have a diversity ratio of 85 out of 100 points. Officer Acosta, who took this selfie pre-COVID, uh, this was taken at California State Stanislaus, and three of the people you see in the background were hired as a result of this um, recruiting event. Um, I also previously spoke that we uh, do in-person recruiting presentations to the unaffiliated police academies. We also like to focus on those academies and communities high in diversity. For example, we, we attended the Delta Police Academy in Stockton, Fresno Police Academy, and the Pitts, Pittsburgh Police Academy in Contra Costa County. Next slide. I'm now going to change gears and talk about the diversity within the police department. The, current, the department currently divides ethnicity into 18 self-reported categories. These category, categories are then filtered into six race data categories used by the U.S. Department of Civil Rights. They are American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Native Hawaii, Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, white, and white is the sixth. The department also included a seventh category of not specified for those employees who chose not to specify their ethnicity, which is their right under state and federal law. Next slide. First, I wanna talk about the claimed ethnicities for the last three police academies. San Jose 39 started with a total of 51 recruits in October of 2020. 2% checked American Indian or Alaska Native, 2% checked Asian, 2% checked Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, 4% checked white, and 90% did not specify their ethnicity. 
So based on the, the large number of recruits, 90%, that chose not to select, who chose to select the not specified category, it's difficult to see the true diversity of the academy and all the hard work we at the recruiting unit are, are doing to try and ensure the future police officers of San Jose reflect the community it serves. Next slide. But as you can see, um, I don't see it on mine. There we go. As you can see from this picture of San Jose 39, there's a lot of diversity. Um, so again, 90% did not specify, not, to hit the not specified box when, when asked about ethnicity, but as you can see here, it's very diverse. Additionally, this academy had was 15% female. Next slide. San Jose 40 started with 40, 42 recruits in February of 21. There was far less not specified than the prior academies. Although that category was still the highest, the not specified category was still the highest at 37%. So 7% were Asian, 3% Black or African American, 12% Hispanic or Latino, 7% Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and 34% White. Next slide. But here's a picture of San Jose 40, which also shows the diversity. Um, their uniforms were different because we were late getting their khakis, but that's why they're in blue versus the other pictures of the academies. But it, uh, import, more importantly, additionally, this academy was 22% female. Next slide. So our San Jose 41 is our most junior academy and it started in June of 2021 with 32 recruits. Um, there was only three, three ethnicities uh, or two ethnicities and, a not, and not specified were selected. 6% Asian, 3% white and 91% checked the not specified uh, box. Next slide. So here's a picture of 41. And once again, you can see the diversity uh, amongst the group. And we're very excited to say that this academy was 32% female, which is the highest percentage of female recruits in the history of the police department. Next slide. So in February of 21, the PISPIS committee asked the department to continue to provide demographic information annually as part of the, as part of the recruitment activity annual report. This is the first annual recruiting report to contain that dem demographic information. The department strives for a diverse and ethnic recruitment, which mirrors and potentially exceeds the ethnic makeup of the city. According to July to the July 2019 United States Census population estimates, the following is the ethnic breakdown for the city of San Jose. 35% Asian, 32% Hispanic or Latino, 26% white, 3% black or African American, and 4% other. Next slide, please. So as of July of 2021, the department had a total of 1,083 sworn personnel. This number is lower than what I gave you when I talked about street ready officers, because this number does not include the recruits in the academy. Um, although they represent filled positions, they're not sworn until they graduate. So they're not included here. So for the 1,083 sworn personnel, the breakdown for the department as a whole was 12% or 127 women versus 88% or, or 9, 956 men. The national average for women in law enforcement is 12%, so we are on par, but I believe with the recent academies and the increase in women, uh, I think we will, we will exceed the, the national average in the near future. Uh, the breakdown of ethnicities are as follows. Asian, 14%, that represents 151 officers. Black or African-American, 4%, which represents 39 sworn. Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, it's just a fraction of a, of a percent at five. Hispanic or Latino, 24% to represent 257 sworn. White is 39% to represent 423. American Indian or Alaska Native is just a fraction of percent at five. And 19% did not specify, and that represents 203 sworn members. Next slide. Now I'm going to talk about, that was the department overall, uh, discussing gender and ethnicities. So now we're going to break it down by rank. So we're gonna start with officers. As of July, 2021, the department had 865 uh, personnel ranked as officers. The breakdown was uh, by gender was 13% for 109 women versus 87% for 756 men. A total side note, when this, when this information was presented to PISTIS in February of 21, it included the female recruits. 
I did not include them in here because they are not sworn. So there might be, a, I think, a 10 person discrepancy in that. Uh, the breakdown of ethnicities for officers, 15% uh, Asian to represent 126, Black or African American, 3% to represent 28, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, just a fraction of a percent at four officers, Hispanic or Latino, 24% to represent 204 officers, White is 35%, 306, American Indian or Alaska Native is 1% with four officers, and 22% did not specify to represent 193 officers. Uh, next slide, please. As of July 2021, the department had a total of 161 sergeants. The breakdown of gender was 6% to represent nine women or, and versus 94% representing 152 men. The breakdown of ethnicities, Asian was 14% for 23 sergeants, Black or African American, 5% with eight sergeants, Hispanic or Latino, 21% with 33 sergeants, White was 55% with 89 sergeants, not specified was 5%, which represented eight sergeants. Next slide. Moving on to lieutenants, uh, we have, as of, the, uh, as, of, as of July, we had 42 lieutenants. The breakdown of gender was 14%. And we have six female lieutenants and 86% um, men, which represents 36 lieutenants. Um, Asians, uh, the Asian, we have one Asian lieutenant representing 3%. We have two Black or African American lieutenants representing 5%. We have one Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander representing 2%. We have 16 lieutenants that are Hispanic or Latino representing 38%. And we have 21 lieutenants that are white representing 50% representing 50% of the lieutenants, and one lieutenant did not specify representing 2%. Next slide. Uh, on to captains, we currently have nine captains. The breakdown of gender was 11% for, for our one female captain and 89% for our eight male captains. The, uh, the breakdown of, of ethnicities was Asian, 11% with one captain, Hispanic or Latino, 33% with three captains, White represents 45% for four captains and one captain did not specify. Next slide. Lastly, uh, regarding the chiefs, as of July 21, the department had six chiefs and we're gonna put them all together, the deputy chiefs, the assistant chief and the chief of police. Two of the chiefs are women representing 33% and four chiefs are male at 67%. The breakdown of ethnicities was American Indian, Indian or Alaska Native is 16% with one chief Black or African American, 17% with one chief, Hispanic or Latino, 17% with one chief, and white, 50% for three chiefs. I know uh, it, it goes from 16 and 17%, that, that that's the way the graph had to like balance it out to get to 100%. Um, next slide. Now, um, going in line of the order of the memo, I'd like to switch gears again and talk about communications. Here's a picture of, of communications applications received for the last five years, five fiscal years. Obviously, there's no doubt that recruiting efforts were reduced during uh, the fiscal year, just as sworn was, um, for the same reasons um, as before, lack of interest, uh, COVID. Um, but you can see, and you can see by the zigzag pattern that the applications go up one year and drop the next. This is um, nothing to do really with COVID, but it has everything to do with um, that communications hosts three basic communications academies every other year and then host only two on the off years. So you can see that like fiscal year 16, 17, we had three basic academies. The following year we had two, uh, 18, 19, we had three um, as you can see. So that, that, is, that is the reason for that and why the zigzag pattern. Because um, basically they open and close their cycle. Um, so when you have three open cycles a year, obviously you get you have more opportunity to get applications versus only two open cycles a year. Uh, staffing wise for communications, they lost 21 employees due to resignations, retirements, not passing training and or taking other jobs with the city. Um, there is currently 14 authorized senior public safety dis dispatcher positions and they have two vacancies. So there's only 12. They are authorized for 81 public safety radio dispatchers and have 16 vacancies as of this time. They're authorized for 59 and a half public safety communication specialists, which are call takers, and they have three vacancies. So overall communications is, is understaffed by 21. Next slide. 
So some of the communications recruiting efforts uh, in July of 2020, we moved a full-time public safety communication specialist over to our recruiting unit here at the substation full-time. Um, uh, she worked uh, with the communications training staff to develop workshops for critical and, and the oral boards. Um, critical is a computerized test that's required for all entry level communications positions as well as police data specialists. Um, so they developed a, a workshop so that to help people and, and prepare them for the test, what to expect, et cetera. They also work to, um, to create oral board workshops and all of this is via Zoom because of COVID um, to, to help people uh, prepare for the oral boards and, um, and ha you know, have an idea of what the process is like. Um, um, our communications recruiter also did information sessions um, where she allowed um, questions and answers. Um, she reduced that to a uh, maximum of 30 per session so that it was more intimate and one-on-one -on -one and had the ability to answer all the questions versus having 90 to 100 people on a Zoom call. I and mean, that's been very effective. Our communications recruiter also attended um, virtual recruiting events with us and attended most of our presentations at, at South Bay. Um, sometimes people know they wanna get in law enforcement, but they really don't know what their role is gonna be in law enforcement. So she's there to provide another aspect of a first responder um, for maybe someone who doesn't want to put on a belt and drive a police car. Um, lastly, what she's been doing, which is very important is early outreach. So I explained that the communication hiring cycle opens and closes two to three times a year, but there's still interest in, in, the, in that time period where the applications are closed. So people will send in interest cards or send emails. And what our uh, communications recruiter does is compiles all these interest requests. And then um, to about three days before we're gonna post for the, new, um, for the new hiring process for communications, She'll send a mass email out to all these interested people. Um, she'll provide her email and a phone number and say, I will be available for these two full days to encourage them to call her in advance. Um, and the results are measurable. We find that we get a lot of applications on the very first day of a posting and through that first week. And then as the cycle, um, the application cycle progresses, then, then the applications go down until it's finally closed. And that next slide, and with that, I'm open to any questions. All right, thank you very much for the thorough report. Um, we will go over to members of the public first. And just as a reminder here, uh, we're taking public comment on item D2, the Police Department Recruiting and Hiring Activity Annual Report. And if you're joining us here by Zoom, you can use the raise hand function or uh, if you're calling in, you can use star nine. And we'll go over first to uh, Tessa Woodmancy. All right, good. Yes, hi, thank you, Tessa Woodmancy. Um, well, the concerns I had um, was that as we uh, go forward, one of the most important things in terms of our changing of our you know, to, to survive as a species is that we need to become, and the other earthlings that we're sharing earth on as we go into the abyss, um, that we're, you know, every step we take is very critical. And so in regards to the police, we, just like with the uh, prisons that we were dealing with yesterday with the county, we need a care, we need a care um, type of uh, um, uh, people in our community, care people versus police. Even the word police is the problem, is to police. And, and then to actually get your recruitments from the military is also problematic because those people are set to kill. I mean, that, that's the program my husband has explained. His father worked in, in Vietnam. And, you know, the, the whole thing with, you know, our military is to kill. And so to use the military and then to, to think that they're going to be transformed, you know, into caring, you know, to the caring population uh, is, a, is, a, um, is doubtful. And so, you know, we really need to think about how we're recruiting as well as the training. And, and also the problem I'm having is, you know, seeing Deb Davis so connected with the police and, and uh, so many of her, her um, campaign um, as she's running for mayor, you know, she has the police, you know, going through town and she has the police, you know, supporting her. She gives, you know, uh, school bags to children, you know, it's, uh, and it's being funded by the police. And, and even yesterday at the county, I heard, they said Lehigh was our partner. 
you know, and even to have the police be our partner when they're actually, you know, you're you're the boss that is, um, you know, deciding how much money goes to the police. I think that really needs to be separated because it is fascistic to to bundle our police with our government. That's fascism where we we're getting into trouble. And we see in her policies is a, a very strong arm policing. And so, you know, we need to disengage that in terms of campaigning. And so that's one issue. Thank you. Next up is uh, Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, one of the reasons, and, and this is something that uh, both uh, myself and Councilman Perales had noted at the last meeting, is that when you look at those pie charts, you see that as the, uh, as the rank goes higher, so does the color. And so the, 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 this is the reason why I applauded the city's decision to hire uh, Chief Mata is because of that. Okay, when we talk about at the beginning of the conversation, she was talking about uh, core values. Those core values are, are built in and set in in the culture by the higher ranking officers. And it trickles down because that's why they recruit from the military because it's rank and file. And so they know that there's already a mindset that can adopt to that very, very easily. That's one of the things that, that, that makes them so attractive. The other thing is that there's a, there's a, there is an inconsistency that Tessa just pointed out, is that they are trained to kill, period. And when they engage, they're engaging the enemy. And we have seen that evidenced in the street. The way that they approached David Tovar was exactly in line with we are going for an enemy. And so that's what we, uh, Fort Hood, you're recruiting from Fort Hood. Fort Hood is named after a white supremacist uh, general in the uh, Civil War, number one. It's also the place where Vanessa Gillian was raped and murdered. And so you're recruiting from, and not only that, just today it, it came out that there is, uh, they have this uh, uh, child porn sex ring over there at uh, Fort Hood. Two, uh, two uh, uh, recruits had gotten ar arrested for it. And so, uh, I do praise uh, Civilian Inc. We're getting our money's worth $28 per application. They're doing an excellent job in terms of the recruitment. I would say stick with them. And uh, yeah, there's so much more, but this recruiting and rank and file and uh, how much color we lose Thank you. going on. Uh, next up is Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman here. I hope a few more people can show up uh, for this item today and, and publicly speak on it. Um, as it is, uh, I'll try my best to, uh, to offer that uh, it was my feeling I didn't, uh, I, I may have missed it, but I, I didn't quite hear what could be some of the good recruiting practices that there could be at this time. What, what are our better practices at this time? I know some get tired to hear those sort of words, but I, I think they're, they're helpful. And, you know, to know how we're hiring in, with a new police chief that, that is hopeful, um, I, I think it's still important to, to list those good ideas and, and maybe some of the good, good practices that they can be learning at the academy at this time. Um, it's just encouraging. And I think it offers a bit of a cooperation at what, what we're trying to build for our future. And I know we go back and forth on these issues. A uh, reminder that it's it's just nice to do that kind of stuff. And it is what we all are trying to learn and how to build our better society uh, and leave the era of war, basically. So good luck how we do that. Um, yeah, uh, we, we are actually, we're, as we're leaving an era of war, we may be headed for an era of uh, 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 natural disaster preparedness of the next decade. So I thank you that, uh, you know, we have to be honest and open how we talk about uh, police recruiting and you guys seem to be doing a fairly okay job about it and uh, you're realistic uh, to, to a fairly certain degree. So I thank you for that. Uh, from 80 officers a year, you know, I, I don't think we have to be hiring that many more officers to get to that magic 1200 number I think we have a pretty good count right now. And, uh, you know, we really have to. Uh, Thank you, Blair. All right, we'll bring it back to the committee. Councilmember Mayhan. 
Thanks, Chair, and um, thanks, Christina and Deputy Chief Randall, for the for the really thorough update. I um, you know, really appreciate all the hard work you're doing to identify, recruit, train, hire, and then retain a really um, talented and diverse workforce. I think it's it's critical work, and I just appreciate getting such a thorough update. Thanks to my colleagues for asking for such a thorough update in the past. Um, I have just a few questions here. There's probably a, there's a lot we could talk about. Well, one, just to start off, is I was really interested in your point about the number of street-ready officers and that number being even lower than the total allowable uh, hires. So we're at 962, I believe you mentioned. And I, I did quick back-of-the-envelope math. So dividing uh, 1 million and 50,000 residents by 962 officers, you come out to about one officer per thousand residents or 10 per, per 10,000, which I think is the more common measure. And I was just wondering if for all of us and, and the members of the public who are on, you could just remind us of how that compares with, with peer cities and other maybe neighboring cities. I, I know that's a, you might not have ready data, but just roughly where, where are our staffing levels compared to other cities? Well, and I and actually meant to pull that, those stats from those other cities and to compare us to San Francisco, LA and San Diego. Yeah. Um, and I, I pulled them. I just didn't write them down. My bad. Um, that we are actually the lowest big city in the in the country per capita. Um, uh, we're basically with our street ready 0.9, you know, 0.9 or one per thousand. Um, other agencies are. I think I don't want to quote. I should have written it down. Um, I want to say that. Well, all the other big cities are are at least double that, um, and we and we're still on the low end, and and always have been. Even when we were at our highest staffing, uh, 1,450, um, the other agencies across the country were also at significant staffing. So we were still the lowest uh, per capita. Um, we're very innovative and, and do more with less, um, as we've proven. Um, but obviously, getting that number up, uh, comparable to other big cities, would be would be would be a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just think in the context of hiring, recruiting, and the broader conversation about staffing, I, I think. It's just an important thing to remind ourselves of. And I think as you're saying, the data I recall was where any, you know, other cities, comparable cities are anywhere from two to five times higher staffing per capita, which I think is just incredibly relevant to the whole conversation. Um, so thanks for that. I, I guess a, a question that the other data in there begs is, uh, given the increased rate of retirements and what at least the last couple of years has been a decline in new candidates uh, for the job. Are, are we concerned as you project out the next few years? Uh, how, how concerned are you about our ability to even meet the, the fairly low staffing levels that we have today? Well, I mean, it is a concern for me and, and all of the police department. I and mean, for example, um, this last fiscal year that I just reported on, we they anticipated 59 retirements uh, or 60, 69 retirements. And in the end, we had 117 um, people leave overall. We did on the other side um, hire 129. So this fiscal year was really not a loss. Um, but as um, you know, as, as people are aging out um, and, and getting retirement el eligible for retirement, I see the numbers increasing. Um, again, a lot of people now, uh, certainly with San Jose, when they hit uh, tier one, I'm talking about tier one employees, when they turn 50 and hit their 25 years, most of them or the majority of them are leaving and not staying. Uh, where it's it's um, beneficial to stay that 30 years because you get that extra 20% of your retirement or uh, yeah 20% of your retirement. Um, so I, I I think we're okay right now, but I think there there will be some some concerns in the future. Yeah, yeah, I share that concern. And and you laid out some of the the various techniques you're using for that top of funnel recruitment, getting getting people interested. And I was curious, I'm sure there's a lot of ongoing experimentation and, and just in the spirit of innovation and being efficient with our limited resources. I, I was wondering if the department has a theory at this point as to which of those approaches are most effective and maybe most cost effective, biggest bang for our buck is that uh, you, you, you know, everything from online marketing and advertising to the fitness classes to the, or, or series, uh, you know, and everything in between. Are, are you making, are you finding that some of these techniques are working such that we might want to double down and invest more resources in those areas, or are we still kind of experimenting and learning? Well, I mean, I think all the in-person events, events um, and fairs vary. Um, we obviously try to go to, um, you know, to um, 
we, we go to coffee with the cop, we go to boba with the cop, we try and all these different little filters, you know, the, we go to the pride, the pride celebration, the pride celebration. Um, but what I think our best recruiting is, is, is the officers out on the street. I mean, really they're, they're the best recruiters for us. They're the ones who come into contact with the public, you know, and a little, and a little boy might ask for a sticker and, you know, I mean, they're the best, I mean, that, that is the best recruiters for us, recruiting for us, but, but the advertising, the digital media is, is been very beneficial as well. Um, again, making presentations at these police academies. Um, I'm looking forward now that the COVID restrictions are lifting. I'm really looking forward to traveling out of state. Um, it, it, as we get some success with out of state candidates because it's California, oftentimes they're from New York or Chicago. Um, but it's really hard to pinpoint one specific um, recruiting effort but I, I would put my, my money on the, the advertising, the digital advertising. Um, at the minimum, they're able to get all these groups of people together to an in-person event. And without their help, we wouldn't have as much success at these events. That makes sense. So they're sort of integrated. And actually along those lines, I wanted to just quickly ask on the digital advertising front, are the, the numbers seem pretty impressive. Are you still working or do we still have a contract with Civilian Inc. or what is? I think I read earlier today that that may have lapsed. Are we? And I apologize if I missed it in your presentation. What's no, the no, forward no. It, it, plan? It, it, it expired. It expired in April of, of 21 of this year. Okay. Um, and and but we have been working with purchasing and to get the RFP and get it out to bid to get that back because we we know we need it. Um, so yeah. we're going to expedite that project that project and ask for the funds for it in the um, in October for the that budget meeting. Okay, great. And then last quick question and then, and then comment. Um, I, so I know in the past there's, there's been, there's been some discussion of recent academy graduates taking jobs in other cities. And I, I know there's, I believe there's some work to, to change that trend. Is that something, is that a phenomenon we're still seeing today? Is, is that a concern? Well, we hadn't really been seeing it much this last year, but I think um, now that COVID restrictions are, are, are lifting and agencies are hiring, I, I do fear that that's going to be somewhat of a trend. Um, because during during the last year and a half of COVID, we continued to hire academies of 50, 40, 50 people, and other agencies did not. So now we have those those people employed with with um, with the you know the experience, and now these other agencies are advertising for laterals, uh, offering signing bonuses. Um, so I don't see it right now, but I could see it now that these other agencies are hiring. Yeah. Well, that leads to my last comment, which is just, I'll just say for myself personally, I, I think, you know, as part of this report, as we circle back to this conversation in the future, would, would love to hear proposals, ideas, things that, that council might consider as actions to help. And that's why I was asking the question of ROI, you know, is it a little more, more dollars for marketing? Is it partnerships with council offices? I have no idea, you know better than we do, but what what can we do either through our offices or through future budgetary action that's going to have the biggest impact on this pipeline question of, of hiring a, a diverse and talented, you know, pipeline, which is what I think we all we all want. So uh, hope to see more of your recommendations and suggestions in the future. But again, really appreciate the report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other colleagues at the moment. Uh, just to pick up where Councilmember Mayhan left off. I know the the biggest thing as a council that we we uh, can do or refrain from doing is is what we did uh, back in 2009, uh, attacking public pensions, uh, going after public employees. Uh, that drove away not just police officers, but public employees across the board. And that really started this trend that we're at today, where we went from uh, 1,400 officers to, you know, uh, at one point, um, around 800 uh, officers, street ready officers, and uh, and we're still fighting to get back to those numbers today, as is pointed out. And quite frankly, that's why we're in this massive effort of recruiting uh, retention. Um, and so it's it's been a challenge now for over a decade. And um, and you know it's it's something that I think that uh, we as elected officials um, have uh, it, you know through time um, memory can 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 begin to fade. And I do think that that's something that, that's, that's you know, truly important what we can do. We wouldn't have been in this boat and trying to, to have to rebuild uh, where we're at. Um, but uh, I think that the efforts we've put in certainly are paying off. And um, I'm, I'm glad to see the numbers within the academies that we have today um, and the growth. And we have a, a, a new problem that uh, Chief 
Garcia told us we'd have as, as he was exiting, which is that we're now bumping up against the capacity that we we have within our our total um, our total sworn, and uh, even utilizing the higher ahead, um, we're going to have to start to slow down, as was uh, you know included into this this report and this memo about um, the the capacity within our academies. And uh, I think that's something that we, we especially given the, the current uh, culture right now uh, and how difficult it is to to hire, I think that's something that, that we don't want to, to be in that boat too long. So uh, next year during the budget process, I think that's something that we'll want to address head on and see is there some growth capacity within the overall uh, sworn numbers to see if we can increase that and then um, and then allow to continue the hiring that we've been doing and continue uh, to, to to offset the numbers of, of officers that are we see are seeing retire or leave. I'm glad that we haven't seen uh, that happen in uh, in droves as we have seen in other areas as, as we did see a decade ago. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's still going to be a bigger challenge to to recruit and hire. Um, that is obviously the case and was was denoted in the report. And speaking to that, uh, Lieutenant Anaya. Uh, you, you pointed out a number of the different strategies. What what I didn't see was um, how fruitful some of these were. So I'm curious if you don't have to necessarily rattle those numbers off now, but in, in next year's report, that's something I'd be interested in just to see where they're particular, and this kind of along the lines of what Councilmember Mayhem was saying, was there something like with the military events or online presence or the career fairs, or were there specific events? You mentioned some key ones uh, where we had you know, we had sort of an in, insider's uh, info, but then now you know, we're competing. Were there some of those that, that we saw uh, a great return on investment on actual applicants and then people that, that made it through the academy or at least into the academy? And so that uh, I'm curious about. If you have something off the top of your head, great. If not, that's something I'd like to see next year with just a, at least picking out a couple of the the key categories that were fruitful and how I'm, I'm curious how fruitful they were. Um, and, and maybe those are areas that, you know, we... We doubled down in. We had we had talked about this a couple years back, um, where um, we looked at, um, you know, some of the efforts we were doing, some of the, the 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 travel we were doing, and trying to determine, you know, was that really paying off uh, with getting applicants and then people hired, um, or or not, and then you know where should we refocus efforts? So I, I'd I'd like to see that. So I'll I'll let you respond if you can. Yeah. So so I don't have the numbers offhand, but I took some notes here. Um, what what actually would be a great idea for us is during the background process is to simply just ask that question where you know how did you hear about us what event did you see us at and then follow their progress i don't have those numbers offhand um if i had to in my personal my personal opinion i believe that we get uh, most of the numbers from south bay again that uh, south bay academy these are people paying paying to take the physical agility test where if you take it with us it's free of course, we won't share your physical agility results with any other agencies, but we want to uh, incur that cost and make it beneficial for them to come and test for San Jose. But we go to those those people look people looking for law enforcement jobs, and that's what they're doing at South Bay when they take those tests. They're looking for law enforcement jobs, so our presence there is huge. And although I, I can't give you numbers, if I had a guess, I would think that that's going to be one of our highest. Um, but something I will work on for next year for you to get some more information and, and to see which which places and which events and, and strategies are working the best and, and, and the success of those candidates that we get out of those those events. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. So I appreciate uh, you doing that, being willing to, to incorporate that next year. Um, and hopefully from now till then, we are able to get out a little bit more in person. So you're able to get uh, some, some better diversity uh, than what we had last year. And, and I do think that that trend's gonna continue on how difficult it is to hire right now. So next year, um, we may be, you know, really trying to figure out how do we focus differently than what we've done, you know, over the past couple of years, when we saw a, a good increase in, in applicants through our efforts. Uh, now that it's going to be a little bit harder to, to get people to apply, um, we may need to go back again and retool and refocus. I, I, I would agree that the, the partnership with Civilian Inc. seems to be something that is working really well, and it's obviously something that can adapt you know, regardless of what's happening with the changing of the times, um, right? As you as you point out, it's it's able to learn and adapt, and and, and it can focus our uh, our resources, our dollars in the right place. And so it seems like that's a that is a, a great partnership, 
and I'm glad we are going to uh, re-up that and, uh, and and hopefully that continues to, to pay off. Um, shifting a little bit into the uh, ethnicity definitions, and I know we, we talked about this last time, uh, but we just, we get such odd uh, numbers, varying numbers on the not specified. Remind me again, how it is that that's, you know, where it is that the, that checkbox comes up and how, you know, how is it that, that we get such varying uh, reports on that? So when they um, are given their final job offer and sign their employment papers with the city, that is when they um, check, they, you know, it offers these six, well, seven boxes. Um, and that's, that's when they check it. I, I don't know why. I mean, I, I could guess as to read, you know, I well, actually, um, uh, Captain uh, Gene Tabaldi actually went to San Jose 38 class and kind of asked them some questions about why um, why they were checking non-specified and, and the answers varied from, I don't really think I need to share that with you or I have such a diverse background and I'm represented by so many different ethnicities, I didn't feel comfortable just checking one. Um, and so those are, you know, or, you know, they just, they don't have to, you know, they're, they're not, it's not required, it's an optional thing. So those are some of the answers that uh, she received from San Jose 38. Um, I don't know why, um, you know, and, but it does seem, and, and just when you look at um, at the ranks I represent, I, I showed, you know, gender versus ethnicity, as you go through the ranks, you can see that the recruits have the highest, or the highest um, category that check not specified. Officers are second and then sergeants. But when we were all hired, the lieutenants, captains, those who have tenure, it wasn't an option. So I think as, as the police department grows and matures and, and the people we're hiring now are in those uh, positions of rank later, you're gonna see that those numbers spread through the ranks, but well, right now they're just not yet. But the recruit, the, the academy recruits are, are really the most that are not specifying. Is that list um, of seven, is that a city list or is that- No, that's the, um, the US Department of Civil Rights. Uh, the oh, six, it's, a, it's a federal, the, federal. Yes, the six, and then the department added the seventh of not specified. Could we could we add a, a an eighth of mixed race or something? As you point out, I imagine that one probably comes up often. That there's people that say, "Hey, I I don't want to check one of those boxes because I actually could check you know two or three of them." I'm curious if that's something that we could add as well. I I don't know. I would certainly be above my uh, above my head, but I will certainly uh, check into that. Yeah, I'd like to see if, if that's something and if we need our city attorney's office to weigh in on that on, uh, it looks like we added a box. So I'd like to believe that we could add another box. Um, and uh, I, 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 you know, that's something that I personally uh, have struggled with since I've been a kid because uh, my mom's white, my dad's Mexican and my mom's a mixed European, mostly Irish. And it's, I, I looked at the boxes and said, you know, <laughs> I don't really fit into many of them. So, um, you know, so you look for, for where you maybe they're plug in or, you pick the next best thing, which in this case, if you look at that list, it's not specified, right? And it just, and, and, and in my mind, it makes it easy. Uh, it may not change the, the numbers much, but uh, we don't know. And if it's if it's possible, that's something that I'd be interested in seeing is, you know, could we add something like that uh, that would show um, continued diversity? When, when it comes to, and as you point out for a higher rank, so current officers or sergeants, lieutenants, captains and up, um, the data we're getting for that is data from when they were hired. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. And that, so there's no, uh, whatever, getting that data again, for instance, you, we, we have uh, uh, not specified up at the captain rank. You're making it sound like it would have been required back then. So somehow we've got a captain that didn't, didn't specify. So just kind of curious how that would be the case. So you um, employees have the option to go into PeopleSoft at any time and say and change their ethnicity. Hmm. So that that would explain the the difference when it wasn't necessarily, um, you know, for whatever reason they have. I mean, they maybe it becomes an option and they say, you know, I am mixed race and you know what I put when I got hired does not represent me. Um, this is a better box because just like your experience, you know, with mixed race, um, but they do have the option of going in and and, and changing their ethnicity. Okay, yeah, that was. Curious because I, I I I saw that as well. As you go up the ranks, it looks like most everybody is, you know, plugged themselves into some some spot there. Um, okay, let me look back just to see if my 
colleagues have raised their hands. I, I do see uh, Council Member Jimenez, uh, so I'll, I'll look over and see if I have any other questions myself, but I'll go over to Council Member Jimenez in a moment. Yeah, thank you for that. My, my question, uh, so, so a very thorough report. I, I don't recall ever receiving this report and there being so much, as much data as I saw this time around. Maybe maybe it's been a while, but, uh, but I appreciated all the information. Um, my question was around sort of the comments about the, uh, just the large number of folks that just identify as, or, or maybe site not specified as it relates to their ethnicities. And you know, you're going through the, some of the slides you all showed, I think SJ39 was 90%, and then you know you go on to I think the SJ41 was 91%. And so, you know, my my questions I was I was thinking along the lines of uh, Council Member Perales, but what I'm wondering is 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 it possible that the timing at which at which point we ask the question changes the result? So, for example, uh, what if folks when they enter the academy uh, we ask them that. I'm not sure if that's allowed, but I'm, I'm curious if that would fundamentally change the numbers that we get. Um, and, and not to suggest, and I guess what comes to mind for me is if I'm wondering, I'm wondering that if uh, after, um, after being in an academy with a group of say 40, 50 people and building relationships and things of that nature, uh, you sort of get this, I don't want to call it this group think, but maybe uh, or not even suggesting that it's sort of coordinated, but I, I just wonder if allowing sort of that amount of time in the academy fundamentally changes the way people respond to a question such as ethnicity. I know it's optional, and obviously they don't have to provide, and they often don't provide that, but I'm wondering uh, if someone can comment on that, if they think the timing of it would, would, one, if it's allowable, and two, if whether they think that may change the outcome of the information we get. Well, just for clarification, when they, they, they check these boxes, when they sign their final offer letters um, with, H, with um, human resources, which is anywhere from two to three months before the academy even starts, ah, they do okay. not check anything after the, the they're, they're, everything is already done when they start the academy. So unless they go in and change it, um, that information is recorded two to three months before they actually start the academy. Okay, I, sorry, then I misunderstood it as to exactly when in the process it takes place. Okay, that helps him better understand, and that eliminates sort of what I was thinking maybe a challenge. Um, okay. Um, the the uh, other thing is, I mean, we can ask, we can ask, um, uh, you know, just a suggestion. I would have to, you know, check it, but we can ask the academies when they graduate to go into PeopleSoft and and update. Um, it doesn't mean they have to, but you know, since that's an option for everyone, it it's possible that maybe they were confused or or didn't know what to check when they got hired and into the academy and in, in the process of of the training said, okay, oh yeah, I'll go back to the PeopleSoft. And that, that can make a difference. And certainly something that we can remind mm -hmm. the academy, the academy graduates, that's an option for them um, once they're out of the academy. Okay, and it, has there ever been uh, circumstances or, or opportunities in which some of the some of the officers that are leading the, train, the, the academies in which they can go through and sort of do a, a, a rough sort of estimate of how many folks are in the class who, you know, for example, I know that Latinos, we come in all shades and colors, green eyes, blonde, red hair, <laughs> you know, or, or whatever, right? So it's going to be difficult and it's not going to be, you know, very, very, you know, all that accurate, but I think it's still worth exploring whether that's possible. Because I think getting these numbers, getting a sense of who were, who's coming into the academy uh, is very helpful. And so I'm curious if anything, anything like that's been considered. Well, I mean, the only, only concern with that, I mean, we can, we can through the background process, you know, we learn where they're from, what languages they speak. Um, we talk to all their family members. We can, we can make go. our own personal, uh, um, our, make our own personal guess as to what ethnicity they are or what mm -hmm. they want to be want to you know to identify as but i would be uh, i would hate to be erroneous in that and yeah. um, that is so that it's kind of a double-edged sword right i mean we can come i mean if you I mean, we could give you a, a probably a good guesstimate but it wouldn't be accurate and, and at risk of offending right. someone who you know true. might identify as one versus the other true 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 okay all right and also, okay I understand. Yeah, and and yeah. also the you know the names of the candidates, or the the people in the academy. You can look at the names and and you know so you know make your own um, take yeah. make your own conclusions based on the names. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Even that's sort of not not foolproof either, right? Because you, nope. you get uh, you know some Filipino names similar to Latino you know Latino names mm -hmm. or 
Italian names that sound sort of, you know, Spanish. And so anyway, so, so that's not perfect either. And so, okay. All right. Thank you for, for your input. I appreciate it. And I think this is an important thing to just think about. And so I certainly have trust in all of you as you go through this and trying to figure out ways that we can adjust it to get uh, truly accurate information. I think uh, we're, we're in good hands. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Mahan. Thanks chair. And I was going to, um, move the report in a moment unless you have more questions but I, I did have one other question that was sparked by um an observation that you made uh which i thought was interesting the the point which i was aware of but the point about us being able to staff at about 1400 officers um you know almost 10 years ago and and it's it's just interesting to me i think the the question and i think jennifer will probably direct me to reach out to jim shannon offline about this but i do think it would be interesting to know how from a budget standpoint we were able to staff at that level at 1400 then and we're at 1150 roughly now and whether that's a reflection of a shift in budget priorities or personnel costs outpacing uh growth in tax revenue or if there's a third or fourth explanation that i'm not aware of but i, I just i think that would be an interesting exercise especially because this committee looks at both finances and, and budget, and then on the other hand, public safety. And so I'd, I'd just be very curious to understand the fiscal dynamics over the last 10 years and how that shift or why that shift has occurred. Yes, I understand the pension battle, but does that make sense, Jennifer? Yeah, I can, I can help a little bit on that question. Um, so, you know, we had, you know, 10 years of deficits and the deficits were driven by increasing retirement costs uh, as, as one major factor, um, as you've seen in graphs and things like that. Also during that time period, our revenues were plummeting because of the economic conditions. We had the great recession and we also just had the dot-com bust during that time period. And then we also had um, a bunch of investments into our facilities and we needed to you know, theoretically bring, we were trying to bring facilities online, new, new new libraries, community centers, fire stations, what have you. So it was a collision of all of those factors that were causing our deficits during those time, during that time frame. So as part of trying to resolve those deficits and you know, it, they were compounding each year with um, the fact that they were growing and then the, 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 uh, the, the decisions to how to resolve that got more difficult as every year went by, especially we had three years in a row where two of the years, one year was close to almost a hundred million dollar deficit. Then we had two years of over a hundred million dollar deficit, right? Consecutively towards the end. Um, in order to close the gap, we were facing really hard decisions. And, and one of the decisions that we had to make was to cut sworn officers. And so that's where that came from and how, why that, why the police department sworn strength, um, shrunk during that time we were, it was actually at a point during that time period as i was budget director we were contemplating do we close libraries or do we cut sworn it was that difficult right. and so um it was just a very very painful time for this organization so that's how we ended up getting down to the level we had we had and of course the council and the administration tried to find the least painful although it was all painful areas uh to cut in the department, but that's, and we've never really been able to grow the department. We've grown it up you know, very little, and we've also civilianized, which caused some of our sworn strength to be converted to non-sworn, but you know, we've added positions for BART, and we've added you know, a few positions here and there, but really uh, substantially, we've not been able to add back our sworn. Uh, as we, although we had substantially before COVID had uh, closed our structural deficit and kind of got us into a, at least on the line positive slightly, we've just never had the capacity to, to get the ongoing dollars uh, to, to start adding back. But again, we'll see how it goes as we start, you know, as we recover and if there is any uh, something, any more capacity to add back as we go forward as, as Chair Peral has talked about. Yeah, thank you. And I, I appreciate all that context and um, certainly familiar with, with some of it. Um, I think it's just, it's interesting to note that the top line revenue, though, has has increased at, at an average of about 5% a year and yeah. over the last 10 years. So revenue has gone up and to the right at a pace of about 5% a year. I think the, the observation you started with that retirement costs have been crowding out new staffing levels makes a ton of sense to help explain 
why, how it is that revenue can go up, but staffing levels can still be so much lower than they were 10 years ago. So that, that, that was kind of my leading theory, but it's helpful to hear that that's one of the major factors. And then of course, priorities like spending on libraries and other places are, are there is a bit of a zero sum game there. So anyway, we can, I'm curious about the details. We can talk more offline, but chair, unless you had other questions, I was gonna uh, make a motion. I'll defer to you. I did have two more. Sure, uh, okay, I'll put my hand down. Thank you. Um, and uh, number one was in regards to some of the data as well, coming back again for next year, Lieutenant. Um, I'd like to see as well how many, um, maybe applicants, but as well, uh, how many of the hires, new hires we get that are San Jose residents. Because I know we're doing a lot of recruiting outside of, you know, even the state, right, as we're looking across. I think there is something to be said, maybe even more so than the than the racial demographics on the geographical demographics. Um, when we hire people that are literally from within, people from within the city of San Jose, people that know the city, you know, have grown up here, raised here, whatever it may be. Um, and um, and from my own personal experience, right, having worked, I know that we, we tend to have a lot of very local um, uh, officers. And I think there's a lot to be said about that when you're when you're working and you know serving in, in the, the the city that you've you know grown up in. So just curious if we can add that um, to to the report for next year as well. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, in regards to uh, let me look up at the report here. So we have the public safety radio dispatcher uh, rank of authorized positions of of 81, and then. Uh, showing there at the end there due to the temporary duty assignments, leave of absence, uh, the vacancies that were at 46 um, of, of the 81. And, and obviously it starts off pretty poor with just the vacancies of 16. Um, and then a good number in training, which is nice. Hopefully they, they, they make it through 15 of them. But um, I know that's this is an area where we've had constant uh, concern and clearly we've asked a lot out of our dispatchers when it comes to mandatory overtime because clearly right there there's there's not enough when you look at the the the, the authorized at 81 and only having 46 there available um, any other strategies in that part as well I looked at the the report talked about the communications applications also going down you mentioned that uh, that could also be a similar trend to what we see with just, you know, a, a police officer applications. Um, so is there any strategy or anything else in regards to that? I know that that's just a big area of concern. We, we've, on our end as well, we've looked at and can continue to look at uh, salaries, competitive wages, right? And, and seeing if there's something else that we can do, but I'm, I'm not certain if you had anything else to, to add on that or if there was somebody here from, from um, communications. Um, I don't know. I would have to defer that question. Um, I don't know if uh, Deputy Chief Randall could answer that. Um, I, I can jump in here. Um, you know, we over the last three to four years, we have started increasing the amount of attention that we give to communications. And one of those things that we did was bringing over that TDY position. Um, it's been a year since we've done that. And so we're waiting to see um, the end results of that. You know, we start recruiting um, from the moment you have contact with an applicant through the testing process and the background, it's, it's a long time. So we're talking a year to a year and a half. So we're hoping that we start to see improvements there with that TDY position. We are now focusing all comm recruiting out of our recruiting unit um, so that there is a team effort um, to that type of, of recruiting. Um, so we're hopeful. The last hiring that we did, we had 10 positions and we hired 10. Um, so we're hopeful that they will also be successful. Part of the puzzle here is also looking at our training, how we train our CTO program and where we can make improvements so that we have a higher success rate on the back end as well. So we're going to be focusing on both. Um, but, you know, it's going to we're, we're going to look at how our recruiting efforts have paid off and having that TDY position. And I think we'll be able to really have a clearer picture over the next six months to a year. Um, but we're going to continue increasing those efforts. And should we um, contract again with the advertising, that will be a part of those um, digital advertising efforts as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, just another area, obviously, that concerns us. Um, Chief, I see you might have gotten your audio back on. I don't know if you wanted to add anything in. I think we've, we've covered it all. We'll, we'll see if your audio is back. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, I just want to add to what uh, Deputy Chief Randall said is I think in the last uh, several years, we've also 
uh, to your point, uh, uh, provided them with uh, with a raise to make them more uh, com competitive as well uh, with the other uh, radio dispatchers here in the area. So that's something that, again, working with uh, city administration, we have uh, tried to uh, make make these positions uh, more uh, appeasable uh, as opposed to um, you know going elsewhere. Yeah, thank you very much. And I know I had asked this before we had had a special meeting on this uh, maybe a year, year and a half ago. If we could invite somebody from communications to be here next year at the annual this this conversation, um, especially if we're looking at similar numbers, I think it, it would be important to kind of hear just their their perspective as well. I know that that um, you know they can be very vocal at times when it comes to uh, our right when when contract negotiations are up. I'd rather not save some of those conversations for only that time uh, of you know the years and actually have an opportunity to discuss some of these things on a more regular basis. So I'd like to see if we can invite them to participate with us next year. Okay, Absolutely. that's it for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now I will ask uh, for a motion. Great, I'll, I'll move the staff recommendation second. in the memo. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. If we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Yeah. Jones? Yes. yes. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that item. Uh, we'll go down now to item D3, which is our fireworks ordinance uh, work plan status report. And I do see our fire chief here. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, Arthur Belton. I'm acting deputy chief um, in the fire department and function as the fire marshal as well. Helping me deliver this report is Jason Ta, police captain with the police department. Uh, we're here to update you on the police fire, uh, the fireworks ordinance work plan status report. There are three components that we're utilizing in this program. There's the education and outreach to the community. There's a collecting of reports from the community reporting activity of fireworks and illegal firework usage. And then there's enforcement out in the community. The goals of this program reduce injuries and fires related to fireworks, increase the number of actionable reports that we receive from the community, decrease the illegal fireworks activity overall, and increase awareness to the community in terms of fines being increased and the changes in the ordinance. Over the past year, um, the October 2020, there was a July status report given. Out of that, uh, there were new council directives, 11 directives that we have been addressing. This included increasing the fines that were uh, initiated in December of 2020. January and February, going through New Year's and Lunar New Year. April, there was an update provided to PISFIS as well as May to the wider council. In June, uh, the police department started targeted enforcement going towards the July 4th holiday. The online reporting tool was updated and refined and went live with those refinements on June 15th. And the social host ordinance that had been passed by the council and added to the fireworks ordinance went into effect on June 25th. Following the July 4th holiday, we've been reporting, processing reports that were received through the online reporting tool and sending out warning letters and issuing citations. Of those 11 work plan items, seven of those have been completed uh, to date. That includes the fireworks ordinance, uh, ordinance being amended for the social host ordinance, the presentation that was made to the city council in 2020, the fireworks ordinance plan was reinstated into this PIS FIS work plan. The reevaluation of this, uh, it, the protocols around uh, cit citation issuance. We evaluated the use of drones for enforcement. We looked at comparison of fines at other jurisdictions around the Bay Area. And we obtained funding so police could do targeted enforcement around hotspots that had been previously um, high activities for illegal firework usage for this July 4th. 
outcomes. We did increase the fireworks fines. We did expand the host social host ordinance. We pushed out targeted media outreach on social media platforms. There was a joint press conference held with neighboring jurisdictions as well as public safety agencies throughout the county. We expanded our safety messaging through stakeholder outreach and the police crime prevention. And we improved the actionable online reports that were submitted through the online reporting tool. Work plans that remain in progress. We are looking to incorporate the online reporting tool into San Jose 311. Looking at the statistics from this last July 4th, this looks like this may be very feasible. We are con will continue our collaboration with other jurisdictions. Um, an example of this is recently we uh, were reached out from Gilroy. They are looking at um, initiating a possibility of a social host ordinance in their city as well. We'll continue to explore additional grant funding for measures against illegal fireworks and we will look at the outreach campaign and cultural competency analysis engaged with that. Looking at the stats for July 4th, this last holiday, um, starting with the hotline and 311, there were 651 total calls received. The initial attempts are to try and direct those calls into the online reporting tool. It gives us a better gathering of information that we can respond to and more actionable response. So 409 of those calls were directed to the online reporting tool. 236 were still handled by our staff and three were directed from the 311 app. Looking at a four year trend of hotline calls, this trajectory you will see uptick significantly in 2020, July 4th, and has decreased back down to almost pre COVID levels uh, this year. Uh, if you take a note of this trajectory on this graph, you will see it pretty much mirrors the other three departments that interface with uh, illegal fireworks activities. The fire department responded this July 4th uh, reporting period to 56 emergency responses. 32 of those were fires. All of these fires were outside vegetation fires. There was some interface with a fence in one case and an outbuilding in another, but none of them were proper structure fires as we would define them. And none of the calls were for medical. Again, looking at the four year span for the fireworks related calls for the fire department, you will see the similar uptick in 2020, coming back down in 2021, this last July 4th. And here to address the police enforcement activities is Captain Jason Toth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chair Perales, city council members, members of the public. I'm gonna be talking about the San Jose Police Enforcement Plan. So I am a captain for the Bureau of Field Operations that was tasked with setting up the enforcement for this 4th of July. So as Chief Belton had mentioned, we received some funding to actually conduct several proactive enforcement campaigns. And so we started our enforcement on June 10th and June 10th kind of kicked off uh, what we did with um, buying and, and selling illegal fireworks. Uh, we chose June 10th because once we look at some, some other slides on the deck, you'll see that usually about four weeks before the 4th of July is when we start seeing uh, illegal fireworks activity peak. Secondly, we developed a public safety advisory video and we used some of the images and some of the videos from the undercover uh, plain clothes and, and uniformed enforcement operations for this video. So that video was released on the department's social media platforms on June 24th. After that, we were releasing uh, smaller segments of that video all the way leading up to the 4th of July. And the purpose of that video was really to educate the public and, and deter this type of behavior. It also was to promote the new online reporting tool you know, that uh, Chief Belton had referred to. We also conducted visible patrols in hotspot areas. Those occurred usually on the weekends. Uh, you'll see in a, a, a slide next that uh, the weekends is where we see kind of the spikes in this type of activity. So that's where the proactive patrollings were directed. And then lastly, we did 
a uh, few road diversions. These were in the eastern foothills. A lot of those areas we saw last year, a lot of folks were going up in those uh, foothills to either watch fireworks, light fireworks, or do other ancillary activities that, that really caused a lot of problems for uh, the, neighbor, the neighborhoods up over there. We can go to the next slide. So what you guys are looking here is uh, PD related fireworks calls between June 1 and July 6. So it's just a year by year comparison. Starting with uh, 2018. So it really kind of coincides with the fire department status. So 2018, we have about 550 calls for service. In 2019, we saw a slight little de decline, not much, but a very slight decline, and then just skyrocketed last year in 2020 with over 2,000 calls for service you know, between that time period. And we ended up uh, this year with 1,078. So we saw a 47% decrease in our call volume between those dates. Go to the next slide. This is the same data, but it really breaks it down into more of a day. So as you can kind of see from the bottom left, it starts with June 1, and then the bottom right of this uh, slide, it'll, it'll end at July 6. So the two line charts that I'm gonna to refer to is uh, the dark green chart, which is 2021. And just in comparison with the yellow or the gold line, which would be 2020. So we started our proactive enforcement June 10th. That was when uh, we knew last year that was fireworks activity would most likely start to increase. Uh, as you can see, the first weekend was June 13th. So last year, uh, looking at the gold line, it was almost uh, about 83 calls for service that the PD received. Uh, in comparison to this year, we had about 26. As you move on to the next weekend, you can see activities starting to uh, uptick a little bit. Uh, right around June 21, we had about 121 calls on a, the high point of that weekend, comparatively to last year at about 30. I'm, I'm sorry, I got my, my charts mixed up. Last year's gold was 121. This year we had uh, 33, so we, we saw uh, benefits you know, for enforcement already. As we slide over to June 24, June 24 was when we released our PSA uh, for the campaign to deter, educate, and also promote the website. Uh, so we, we were releasing that campaign every few days just to, to kind of keep it on people's radar. Uh, so. Overall, I think that comparatively from last year to this year, we had excellent results. What we did see though, on the actual day of July 4th, uh, you could see that we spiked this year at 264 calls uh, compared to last year of 193. So uh, the only thing unique though, I want to just mention about this year was the 4th of July was on a Sunday. So we had all Friday night, all Saturday night, and all Sunday night. So uh, three days of, um, of fireworks that last weekend. That covers my slides. Thank you, uh, Captain Ta. So continuing, we're looking at the online reporting tool data. Uh, this year, there was over 1,700 total reports. Of those reports, 489 were actionable. We define actionable as those that we can either send out a warning letter, um, or if we have more robust information, we can actually send out a citation on. Uh, the total of those warnings and citations sent out this year are, uh, are 388. If you're doing the math, you will notice there is a difference between the 489 actionable and the combination of warnings and citations. That additional 101 accounts for repeats um, reports that were re reporting the same incident that said when received in another report. Uh, 
And then we had 1,280 and those reports did not either result in a warning or a citation, but they will be utilized for hotspot mapping for future targeted enforcement. Looking at a four year uh, span for the online reporting tool, you'll see the blue line is the total reports received, similar to what we've seen for the three other departments in terms of their engagement over the 4th of July. I would like you to note the orange line, that is the incomplete reports that are submitted. Based on doing the refinements to the online reporting tool, that has dropped to zero. So what that means is every online reporting tool, uh, on every report we received through the online reporting tool was a complete report. Additionally, you'll see the insufficient, and that's the gray line. Uh, that insufficient is uh, we don't have enough information to either send out a warning letter or to cite. But the difference is because of the refinement of the online reporting tool, all of those reports will be able to be utilized for hotspot data mapping for future enforcement. And another look at the online reporting tool, the trend of um, warnings that are able to be sent out for the online reporting tool has been progressively going up over the last four years. So next steps going forward, uh, the team will continue to meet and address uh, the remaining four work plan tasks. We will continue to collaborate with local jurisdictions we will take that debt that as I explained and do hotspot mapping for future targeted enforcement. We're going to be working on looking on how to integrate the online reporting tool into 311 if that's feasible. We would also like to look at how we can automate the report processes. So that concludes the presentation. I would like to, in closing, thank the following people and their staff. This has been a truly collaborative effort across uh, numerous departments. Rachel Roberts with uh, Deputy Director in Code Enforcement. Captain Jason Tao, my co-presenter with the Police Department. Jerry Dreesen, Assistant Chief Information Officer. Diana Yuan with the City Attorney's Office. Carolina Camarena, a director of communications in the city manager's office, and Erica Ray, the public information manager for the San Jose Fire Department. And we are available for questions to be entertained. Right, thank you very much. And uh, we'll go over to members of the public first. And as a reminder, this is item D3, the fireworks ordinance work plan status report. And uh, you can raise your hand if you're joining us on Zoom or if you're calling in, uh, press star nine. And we'll go over first to caller with last four digits ending in 5140. Yeah, got a lot of deputy chiefs, got a lot of deputies of deputies going on, going on down there, San Jose PD and FD. You wonder why we're out of money. But uh, as for the fireworks, man, I was in Las Vegas. People were shooting off fireworks that were industrial grade with no problems. And man, you guys want to make a federal case out of it. I think it's ridiculous. Uh, we've got weeds all over the, the, uh, the highways, the byways, the city streets, the expressways, people's yards. Those things, those things are far more dangerous than these fireworks, I could tell you. Plus, I mean, the Silicon Valley has become so frumpy. Most people don't even light off fireworks in, in many areas. They're too snobby to do so, or they're up in Tahoe or at their beach house. So I don't know what the big deal is. You guys want to lay down all these fines? Fines are just another way to say, hey, we can't solve real crime. Let's get a kid running down the street with a sparkler because those are illegal too. And I've known people in police and fire. You guys confiscate the fireworks and light them off for your family and friends. You know you do it. Don't deny it. I like to, I like to, I like to hear you uh, tell the lie. You've never done that. Both police and fire people you should all be ashamed of yourselves. San Jose PD, San Jose FD. You got San Jose Fire Department can't put out a fire, and uh, San Jose PD can't solve a crime except the kid running down the street with a sparkler. I mean, I don't know what happens when code enforcement doesn't know what to do. They call you guys another worthless, worthless city department. Code enforcement should be abolished. Maybe we should get some more police officers from midnight to six patrolling the area versus a bunch of deputies of deputy chiefs with bankers hours being 
armed administrators. You all should be ashamed of yourself, city council included, mayor, if you're there. Uh, this is just a terrible city. It, we get hey, our next speaker is Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you. Um, so like a uh, forethought to this, uh, all of our um, our works going forward as we are in a climate, a crisis, we need to put the survival of humanity and the rest of life on earth above all other issues. And so in regards to the issue of fireworks, we have pollution. That is a real part of uh, fireworks. They put out a lot of particulate matter. And we have uh, very high pollution. I mean, look at what's happening today. On top of the bad air that we currently have, then we have the, the fire, the particulates from the fires. And that's a big issue, too, is the fire. And then yesterday in my neighborhood, Salvation Army, their three trucks burned up from their storage of plastics and wood or whatever was going on on Salvation Army at Stockton and Taylor. It was burning and put, putting the worst air in our in our community. So these are things that are going forward as, you know, we pollution needs to be really addressed and, and the harms that it does to our community. And if we're going to put, uh, you know, the, the survival of humanity and the rest of life on earth above all other issues, we really have to look at the pollution. And so we need to stop all fireworks. That's what I say. And many other neighbors say that, that we can have, we can't have, you know, even uh, these fireworks that are supposedly, you know, regulated, it needs to be a cold turkey, no fireworks. And and just have that, that you know, you can't have just, you know, Gilroy, you can't, you know, buy them, but you can buy them here or there. It has to be like, you know, no, nothing, cut, like a, it's a contraband coming into our, our, our country. We don't take fireworks, especially the fact that with all the fires going on, because it is a precursor to a lot of fires that start with fireworks. And so we need to stop it completely. And, you know, we, and I don't think we, I think we have to go cold turkey. I know we have to go cold turkey because even when I was hearing the fireworks, oh, is that illegal fireworks? Is that blah, blah? You know, we can't even have those issues. They're so, it was so it, um, destructive, the whole event to our community, to animals and everything. If, if we're supposed to care for it, ourselves and other. Hey, thank you. Next speaker, Paul Soto. Man, I gotta thank that dude that calls in at five one four zero, man, because that dude has me crack it up every single time he talks. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I have some questions with regard to. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for the report. And no property, no structure, no body. That's good. Excellent. Excellent. We had a good year there. No property, no structures, no bodies. Perfect. Um, but I do have. Uh, I would like some data on district by district, the, the amount of phone calls that you get per district, okay, that, that needs to be posted. We need that information. That is accurate information. We can see exactly what's going on in our city. So I would suggest that. Secondly, um, a district breakdown for actionable and the uh, actual citations. So you had 409 and then you had uh, actionable and then you had 10 citations. I would like breakdowns per district with that data. And then what criteria is used for warning uh, as distinguished from a citation? What, what makes the distinction? Where's the line between we're giving the person the warning and this requires a citation? That needs to be articulated. And I, I rarely have uh, access to public officials, so I'd like to talk about arson. On Virginia Street, there's, been an, there's an arson that's loose in this city. Okay, an arson of uh, the Lawrence building, arson. The two uh, structures on Virginia and uh, Almaden, that's arson. On Virginia and Locust, that's arson. And so what I'd like to know is like, what are you doing about this arsonist that is loose in our city? Because they are, they are committing arsons in very strategic places. Virginia is a hotspot for development. Okay, and so I'd really like to know what your department is doing with regard to this arsonist that is loose and that people are profiting from the, that Lawrence building that got burned. Yeah, they profited from that. So uh, I'd like to know your opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, last speaker is Blair Beekman. Uh, hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thank you for this item. A lot to learn. Uh, you know, we're slowly moving forward with. Uh, Cracking down on people in local neighborhoods on the issue of fireworks. I mean, an age-long issue. Uh, 
it's kind of sad. I, you know, there is people within the police department who can have a very uh, progressive opinion towards the subject, and it hurts. Uh, I hope we, you know, you are trying to learn a balance and keep that and keep a uh, good progressive thinking in mind. And uh, I hope you can uh, with this project. Uh, uh, an important reminder that um, fireworks at the state level, as well as uh, guns, the sale and trafficking of guns at the state and national level, there can be a lot of uh, important work done in that territory, I think, that can uh, address this issue possibly even better than, and, than busting people at the local level all the time. If you take care and work on this issue at the state and federal level, that may be in a real important key. And the same with gun trafficking issues. And that does enter into the questions of what is the, what is going on at our state and federal level? I mean, what, what are they doing to allow this, these sort of practices to continue year after year? And um, I think those are questions we need to ask our state and federal government as local communities. And that we have a certain power as local communities that we need to learn to uh, ask more of our state and federal level uh, to stop certain things. We can do that. And I hope we're learning how to do that. And you know how we can learn how to do that right now. We are doing it. And uh, in the next five or 10 years, look out state and federal level, local cities are really developing important peaceful practices. And it's that peace that's gonna be important for the future of this world. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Bring it back to members of the committee. Don't see any hands at the moment. Um, all right, Council Member Mayhem. Thanks, Chair. Uh, well, first, just want to really thank everybody for all your efforts here. I, uh, I know this is true in many of our districts, but certainly District 10 has a lot of urban uh, wildlife, uh, wildland interface, and, and fires are a huge, huge concern for many of my constituents. So just appreciate the ongoing efforts. And uh, data seems pretty promising and excited about the conversation about integration with 311. I think that's great. Uh, main question I had looking at the data is what the warnings, maybe less what they mean, but are there, is there an opportunity for follow-up? Do they create uh, groundwork for future enforcement? Do we, do we keep a record of those warnings for next 4th of July, or is that, is that too creepy? I mean, I'm just curious kind of how we can use that as a tool to sort of reduce these violations over time. Um, Rachel, do you want to address that more specifically, or I can, I can answer? to some level. I can answer it, that's fine. Um, so council member uh, Rachel Roberts, deputy director of code enforcement. Um, so we actually create a case for each um, each property that we're gonna be issuing a warning or a citation to, and those are maintained in our um, code enforcement database. So it's an ongoing record. Um, and if there is another violation, a report of violation with sufficient evidence um, within an 18 month period, then we can move to a citation. Um, if they've already been issued a citation, then we can go to the next escalated fine. So yes, we do maintain that information year after year. Great. Okay. That's, that's good to hear. Um, we certainly, you know, in my neighborhood have some repeat offenders. So uh, that's helpful. I'm glad to hear that we're, we're recording those and can use them for future action. And then of course, I noticed on your chart, I, I think you, you all mentioned the, the, the high number where the, the information was insufficient to issue a citation. Is there anything about the data we're collecting or that residents can provide that might increase our, for lack of a better term, our conversion rate to actual citations? Yeah, so the, so the main issue with those is that um, even though we made some, some real significant improvements to the reporting tool, there were still some reports that, that um, were able to uh, be filed that didn't have specific address information. So it would say something like the corner of Coleman and Almaden, for example. So in those instances, um, we might be able to get a geocode from that or at least map it, but we can't actually you know, send a citation or warning. Right, that makes sense. And is that would that be part of the? I know at the end there, one of the the future, um, you know, goals would would be some process automation. Would that fall into that, or is that a different? Is that something else you were referring to? 
Do you want me to take that, uh, yeah, Jerry, ahead, Dries <laughs> Jerry Dries, <laughs> and, uh, Assistant Chief Information Officer and Product Owner of SJ3 and One? So, um, what Rachel, uh, what we've been talking internally as a team is um, dropping a pin in for a geo pin for to actually show the location. SJ3 and One does that today for other requests, and so that would certainly help. Um, with some of the address information that then would automatically um, be available in a database and and hopefully um, work out like uh, or work better for code enforcement to do automatic automated mailings because they would actually have an address and instead of just typing in um, an address. Exactly. Yeah, that's great to hear. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate all the all the progress and uh, thank you all for your your work on that and look forward to discussing the 311 uh, potential integrations in um, Smart Cities Committee. So uh, that was all I had for now, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you as well. I appreciate the report. Um, the question I have is in regards to the drone. You put it in the report there as to why that was uh, not being recommended at the, this time. It's something that constituents of mine uh, have been inquiring about for some time. And uh, my understanding is there's other cities that are utilizing the drone for you know, fireworks enforcement. So just kind of curious on, on that response there in regards to, to why we chose not to. Well, we, we deal with a couple issues in our city specifically. We have two airports that are airspace. So you can't interfere with that airspace with drone flying, which is also happens to be um, an area in terms of some of the hot activity on the east side um, happens to be around one of those airports. So we wouldn't be able to use drones in that case. That is one of the factors um, also, I'm not sure about how well we can actually gather data that's going to be identifiable to, to be able to actually deliver warnings and citations. More specific to the enforcement arm, uh, maybe Captain Talk can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so council member, uh, even with the use of a drone, uh, during nighttime operations, you're, you're going to get very probably unusable imagery just because most of the fireworks are, are being lit off you know, at, at night. In the event though, that you do get a good image, let's say a, a good facial image, uh, th there's still follow-up that needs to be done. Just because you see somebody's face doesn't mean that you know who they are. So each and every one of those images has to be followed up with uh, some so sort of follow-up investigation. That could be uh, the officer knocks on the door of the house to try to match up that person's face with the face on the drone. Uh, what we see, though, from traditional enforcement is when officers come up and knock on the door, uh, nobody answers. So it, it, it complicates it when you have a little bit of information, but you don't have enough to actually do anything actionable. So the drone, unless there was some uh, technological advance where they could just simply identify somebody or we could see an associated license plate with that image, uh, it, it, uh, it does require a significant amount of uh, follow-up investigation. Okay, I appreciate that. I understand the, the, the challenges there um, and recognized the limitations we have, as I know, with the drone already. Um, and you know, we, there's a lot of other interest um, personally that I may have, and I know that within the police department on where we could utilize the drone, but um, I think we, you know, we're, 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 we're not even there yet. Um, and so, I uh, appreciate that. I do like that we we have continued to trend upward on our enforcement over the years and with the use of the online reporting tool, albeit, right, we still have a lot of insufficient info, but I think we recognize that that's because there's a there's a higher threshold there on on information. Um, and and so hopefully that will um, that will continue to improve as well over the years. But thank you for the the report. Uh, I will turn it over now to Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to direct this uh, question to Captain Todd because I know he can handle it because uh, it's going to be a tough question. Uh, is this war winnable? And, and the reason why I ask that question is there's so many people that are out there setting off fireworks. Um, the police can't be everywhere. Um, there's not a fear of getting caught. And, and I think that you know, and I commend all the efforts that have taken place already, but I'm skeptical and I've been skeptical for a long time. And I just want to get your thoughts on, is this something that that's winnable that we could solve or are we, are we just trying to 
mitigate, you know, the, the damage. I mean, just help me understand what we're trying to do. And I did warn you that it was going to be a tough question. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. I, I do think that we were very successful this year uh, because we worked together. I mean, it was really a team approach uh, to get some funding for enforcement. We, we had to use on-duty as well as off-duty overtime officers that we could dedicate to certain areas. Even without a citation, I mean, we did get some pretty good numbers. We had 13, 13 arrests. We seized over 550 pounds of illegal fireworks. We were all over the internet. Uh, so people were worried about whether they were dealing with a uh, undercover officer when they were trying to buy or sell fireworks. All that I think is uh, very good, very positive. I also do think that the social host ordinance is, is moving uh, us in the right direction and uh, maybe continue research on how that looks uh, here, you know, with our current policy and compare it to how it looks somewhere else per se, you know, to see if we can automate, you know, some of those warnings a little bit better because I, I do feel that if the warnings go out sooner, you know, within that four week cycle before the event or if the citations go out, you know, sooner then it would have a more direct impact on the behavior before the event. So I, I, I'm optimistic. I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, cutting this by 47% to me is a huge win with only 10 operations. So obviously it wasn't all enforcement. It was the, the group effort by fire, code enforcement, IT, city attorney's office. So what you're telling me is I shouldn't be so pessimistic. Have some I of that optimism rub off on me. Yeah, I think maybe let's look at next year and, and, and see how we do. We're moving in the right direction. Thank you, Captain. All right, thank you. Uh, looks like that's the end of the comments and questions. So if I can uh, entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second for this report. And uh, just wanted to confirm, is this getting... Uh, cross-reference or no? It's not staff's recommendation to cross-reference it, but certainly if, if, if we would like to, we can do that. Uh, I am okay if it does not. Um, so I'm comfortable with the report as is. Um, all right, then we have our motion in a second. If we can get a roll call vote, please. Arenas? Council member Arenas? Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jimenez? We have we have lost uh, Councilmember Jimenez. He 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 uh, gave me a notice. He had to drop off. Perales. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Motion passes. Uh, we do seem to be borderline uh, losing a quorum here, um, and we do have our last item. So uh, hopefully uh, my colleagues can stick it through here. Um, we have item D for our Office of Emergency Management Work Plan priorities annual report. Good Welcome afternoon, me. committee chair, um, committee members, acting city manager, city staff, and members of the public attending today. I'm Ray Reardon, the director of the city manager's office of emergency management. Uh, and I'm glad to be hitting a cleanup spot here. So we'll wrap it up after this, I guess. Um, annually, the city manager's office of emergency management reports to the Pitt Space committee on the objectives and key results that were accomplished in the previous fiscal year and the priorities for the current fiscal year and moving forward. Next slide. Thank you, Nancy. Um, the report is presented acknowledges the work of the Office of Emergency Management and leading the overall city effort in emergency management and some of the key results completed by the Emergency Management Work Group. The Emergency Management Work Group involves department executives and leaders who have responsibility for actions to improve the city's overall readiness. The list of activities come from the last after action reports from the last uh, several disasters. This report focuses on the high level effort identified in the OKRs or the objectives and key results. The report identifies what was accomplished in the last fiscal year and what we're targeting next. The four uh, objectives and key results are follows. The city has a plan to tackle any emergency which we've seen here during COVID and other situations, quickly developing plans to make response happen. 
The employees, residents, local organizations, and businesses are ready to take action and are able to answer the call to take action. Our community trusts the city to communicate and address need. And lastly, the fourth on the right, our emergency response is optimized through technology. Next slide. Uh, we'd be here a long time if I read off all the accomplishments, and I know we're getting close to, to late time. So I'll, what I'll do is highlight uh, a key verbal item or uh, a key items that we identify in each one of the, the OKRs. Uh, so the city has a plan. We have two key items we have listed here, and that is we updated our power vulnerability plan, which provides information on how to handle a PG&E public safety power shutoff or other power outage situations. Uh, planning for a city incident management team is also completed, and this is important because, as we've seen, we've already, the PG&E has already started to to call for PSPS events. Fortunately, so far they've not been activated in our area. The city also formed a vaccination task force in December to plan for a variety of support functions, such as first connecting communities to vaccination, second vaccinate, uh, vaccination outreach and communication, three creating an advocacy on equitable vaccine allocation and distribution uh, at the state and federal level, and four scaling employee vaccinations. And we've seen that direct support and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, in the call to action, in response to the Santa Clara unit lightning complex fire last August, the city opened Evergreen Community Center as a resource center. The city also uh, had Southside, Almaden, Berryessa, Roosevelt, and May Mayfair Community Centers on standby to serve as shelters if needed. Animal Care Services was also on standby to support domestic animals if they needed that. Starting on April 27th, the city's Community Emergency Response Team program relaunched in a hybrid environment. Uh, we had spent uh, a significant amount of time working with FEMA to create a program that was accept acceptable to them. This combines 12 hours of online trainings and a one-day hands-on skills training day. Uh, since April, 50 more people have completed a CERT program for a total of 336 since the relaunch of our CERT program. As of June 8th, the city has held 24 vaccination events, delivered over 25,000 vaccinations, hot meals, groceries, housing shelter referrals, rental assistance, transportation assistance, access to mobile uh, hotspots, laptops, and iPads, tax and stimulus check support as well. Also included hygiene toilet kits and en enrollment and other supportive programs that residents could reach in partnership with 45 other healthcare and community partners. Next slide. In the community trust the city, during the fiscal year of 2021, the city emergency public information officer published 48 flash reports on the city website. These reports provided notifications and updates on COVID-19 response and recovery efforts to the community and were transcreated into Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, both the traditional and simplified. Secondly, the city worked to construct and open three emergency interim housing communities to help protect approximately 317 unhoused people from COVID-19, slow the, the spread of the disease and expand the city's interim housing capacity after the emergency recedes. The site locations included the intersection of Monterey Road and Bernal Road, uh, Rue Ferrari near Ho Highway 101, Evans Lane near Almaden Expressway, and a fourth interim housing uh, site uh, at Guadalupe Lake Parkway and Taylor Street uh, is coming to the council in September. Construction is projected to begin in October. And in our last OKR, uh, optimization of our response through technology, the EOC Digital Inclusion Branch uh, via the public, the San Jose Public Library, launched a device lending service in August, as part of August 2020, as part of the San Jose Access, a citywide initiative aimed at combating the digital divide. There are 3,000 hotspots, 600 Chromebooks, 120 iPads available to the community for checkout. From August 20 to August 2021, the devices have been checked out 9,858 times. Um, and lastly, a virtual groundbreaking was held on March 11th for the new San Jose Fire Training Center and the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, the, EOC, the Emergency Operations Center will also uh, include administrative space for the OEM offices as part of the construction 
slated to end uh, at the end of 2022. Next slide. Next on our work plan priorities, uh, looking at the next fiscal year, in terms of the city has a plan, I'll highlight just two of the items. We have more listed there as well. The COVID response delayed work we had started the previous year. Uh, so for this year, we, we want to resume and complete the work on our post-disaster housing plan, which has proven very important to many other areas right now under evacuation orders. The crisis communications plan, which was really bolstered this year through the COVID response. Our mass care and shelter plan, our debris management plan, which is critical after all emergencies, and our event action plans. We're also working with the county to develop an operational area-wide safety and damage assessment plan. And it's a collaboration with the county will be very critical, especially when we uh, see a future earthquake uh, and all the ways of communicating damage assessment information. Secondly, we also wanna initiate an after action report for the COVID-19 response. Now this may be a little bit delayed because again, we've reopened the EOC. So we may postpone this a little bit back, but we do plan to accomplish that in the next year. In the call to action um, OKR, the delivery of the monthly CERT program has continued and will continue in the hybrid environment until we lift the, um, the COVID issues recede. And we will also launch a program guide to make sure all our programs in all 10 council districts continue to survive and improve and grow in each one of the neighborhood areas. And then lastly, we want to complete a strategic plan outlining city emergency management goals and objectives over the next five years that'll identify a path forward in emergency management and get certification with the Emergency Management Assessment Program, which is a, excuse me, a national program certifying cities in the programs that they put together. Next slide. In the area of community trust in city, we wanna continue or uh, bring back our public education program as soon as the COVID resides and look at doing online programs to reach out to the community on community preparedness. We also wanna make sure that we update our data with the transcreated information that we've been doing for COVID, that all our information is timely and done in multiple languages. So we reach out to a greater number of the public. And then the last uh, goal listed here to, on this uh, slide set is we want to optimize technology uh, through our response. And that's of course, continuing the construction of our new OEM offices and the EOC with the funds generated by Measure T. And lastly, continue implementing GIS applications in the EOC to enhance the, the city's situational awareness and communication with the public. Next slide. This will end this re verbal report and the request is to accept the annual report uh, for OEM. Thank you very much, uh, Ray, for the extensive report. And we'll go over to members of the public first. Uh, as a reminder, we are on item D4, the Office of Emergency Management Work Plan Priorities Annual Report. And uh, if you're joining us over the phone, you can press star nine uh, or raise your hand on the Zoom function. And given the timing that we have, I'm actually gonna uh, limit the time to one minute. So I'll ask our uh, clerk's office if they can adjust that. Uh, we're on the verge of losing quorum here. So we'll lower that to one minute and then we'll go over to our speakers. First up will be Paul Soto. One minute, huh? Okay. Check this out. Blair Beekman has done a better job about warning us about the emergencies and, and, and setting the tone for these types of topics far better than this gentleman did. Okay, yet Blair gets not a penny, nor do I. Secondly, I need a, a public announcement as to what my role is in these meetings, because I've been asking questions and I've been met with nothing but silence. I have a right. I have an absolute right to question the people that are making these decisions within these departments, and it doesn't have to be filtered through you. I'm tired of this Republican type of system because this is not a democracy. A democracy respects the sanctity and the individuality of the person, not the Republic. This Republican form of government is not.
Thank you, Paul. Next up is Tessa Woodmancy. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's why we really need it to be in the charter. We have to put resiliency and the, the issue of climate emergency, which is at our doorstep, and all the emergencies we're facing, all the crises, we have to be prepared, and it has to come. Out. It can't be politically motivated because there's evil, immoral, selfish and greedy is what is happening with our politicians. It needs to be in our charter, and it's been very difficult to get it in the charter because of the way the evil, immoral, selfish and greedy. And so we have to get it in the charter so that we deal with resiliency and mitigations. Mitigations is what causes, creates resiliency. And that is, we shouldn't be having to create 108 million um, food deliveries using fossil fuels when we need to learn to grow food locally. That needs to be what we are doing. And we need much more nature. Nature is healing with all the crises and all the displacements of people. We need nature. We need to buy 615 Stockton Avenue and create. Thank you, Tessa. Next up is caller uh, with the last four digits ending in 5140. Yeah, I'm really scared about the EMS uh, people here. Emergencies are, you guys can't put out a fire. You can't solve a crime. Coyotes roam the neighborhood, shredding up people's pets. Uh, like I said, weeds all over the place are a fire hazard all year long, but you're worried about a kid with a sparkler. Uh, you call 311, 911, you get put on hold. No help at all. Try calling San Jose PD, just their regular phone line worse than calling the DMV. DMV and the IRS has better service than San Jose PD, and the, 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 the chief talks about how he's going to have customer service. You guys can't even pick up the phone. What's going to happen when something real happens? And the biggest natural disasters are the mayor and the city council. Those are the natural disasters that we have to worry about 365 days a year. Forget an earthquake or a major fire. Which is going to happen. It's going to happen. Or, or a. Okay, thank you. And our last speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, to address emergency si uh, situation issues for the next few years and decades, uh, I, I feel that we possibly we've arrived at a good number of police officers. You know, maybe a hundred more. That would be twelve fifty. That would be pretty good. And then it's from there we start to address health and human services issues and really address the future of uh, police overtime. I think we really have to stress that and, and consider that. Um, at uh, smart at uh, was it uh, at city council last week, there was a lot of uh, uh, ideas mentioned about the future of uh, data collection services, smart cities. Um, there's an incredible emergency. Uh, uh, data portal that is starting up that sounds really interesting. Uh, don't be scared of it. It can actually create help all parts of the community. I think it can bring us together as a community. Good luck on those data collection efforts and work on the website. Make sure the website is honest and open for all of us. Everyone's confused by it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now coming back to the committee, uh, Director Mahan, or excuse me, Council Member Mahan. Th thanks, Chair, and I'll try to keep my comments to about a minute as well. Ray, thank you for the report. I really enjoyed reading the, the full memo. Appreciate the incredible work you and your team have done uh, over a very long, you know, year and a half or so. Um, wanted to also just, you know, thank you for the forward-looking work plan. Appreciate the emphasis on technology investments. Also appreciate the notes on investing in CERT, which is something I personally really believe in, and I've seen what it means to members of our community down in District 10 who have participated in the program and I think there's a lot of potential there. And then the, the, the one question I have for you is, you, you mentioned in one of your bullets there, completing the strategic plan for our city's emergency management goals and objectives. And I just wanted to ask kind of the, the timeline and whether or not that would come back to this committee or where what the follow up on that might look like. Thank you for the question, good question. The strategic plan is, is uh, we, it was put on hold again because of COVID. We started meeting again, then COVID raised its head. So as soon as we get over the, the hump here, we're gonna try and get it completed in this fiscal year. Uh, and the intent is we will bring that information 
forward as well as part of the kids big report perfect all right well look forward to it thanks again for uh all of your efforts in the thorough memo and chair let me know if, when you want a motion yeah uh you can make one now i'm just going to give some congratulations and thanks so sure well i'll go ahead and uh that's that's right i'll go ahead and move the staff report second all right, we have a motion and second. Thank you. I yeah, just wanted to echo the appreciation, Ray, for you and, and, and your team. Uh, this past year, uh, a lot has been put on your plate, uh, more than I think uh, you ever expected and that we ever expected of you and your team. But when you came in, um, you helped us to ensure that we can continue our focus on readying um, your department and, and really being ready for really any emergency. We, we did not know, right, that it would be something like this uh, and it would be carrying on over a year. Um, but being prepared really for anything was, was, was what we wanted to do and what you helped us do. And now you have helped us through it. And on top of that, uh, we've had a, a pile of other emergencies, right, that have now happened. Um, and so, uh, just, you know, uh, very, very pleased with the work of your office, uh, with this work plan moving forward for the year to come. I would agree with the sem sentiment that's in it there that, that we are prepared. Um, you know, I, I think you can always be uh, even more prepared as we know, that's just the case, right? You can, you can add on more insurance if you want. You can, we can try to tack on more staff. Um, and I think, you know, you are the right person in place to help us ensure that that uh, we do those things, we're focusing in the right places. So just thank you uh, to you and, and, and your team for that. Well, thank you for the support from the city manager's office and from the council, really do appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, uh, if we can do a roll call vote now. Jones? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Corrales? Yes. Thank you. Okay, motion passes unanimously. That'll take us to open forum. Um, and I am gonna limit the open forum as well to uh, one minute. And then the uh, just as a the, the public service announcement, as uh, Paul Soto was inquiring about, uh, the public speaker com comment period for each item, and then as well as on this particular open forum item, are opportunities for the public to, uh, to comment. Um, it's not an opportunity for uh, engagement with uh, the staff that is uh, what your elected representatives like us are, are up here uh, to do, um, that that is not the opportunity, but public employees are accessible, uh, whether it's council or even any of the employees that, you, that you've heard from today um, through publicly accessible emails or, or phone numbers. Um, and, and I encourage you to reach out to them uh, outside of, of these meetings. So, and, and we'll now open it up for the open forum and Paul, you're first. These need to be public forum, no. That's not acceptable. That's the reason why there's corruption. These questions need to be answered within the public sphere. Okay, and you're going to circumvent that using law to prevent a citizen like me that is engaged. Dude, I go to 40 hours of Zoom meetings per week, 30 hours of research. Okay, just to prepare for these meetings and you're gonna deny me something like that? Perales, you're confused about your race. Months ago, you said when they were cruising and doing these donuts in the street, you said, yeah, no, the way we do it is low and slow. That's your identif identification with Chicanos. Now, all of a sudden, in this particular meeting, you want to act confused about what your race is. So what are you, Perales? Are you Chicano? Are you white? What are you, Perales? Huh? Why don't you put that out uh, you know, in the public sphere so we know what you think you are instead of you kowtowing to the Chicanos in this community and then back. Thank you, Paul. Uh, now speaker with the uh, last four digits, 5140. One minute, you guys can't take the criticism. And if it's, Paul's correct, you try to call all those people, all those deputy chiefs, they never call you back. Your own staff, you call up your offices. You guys have never pick up the phone, never call back, never return emails. If you do, it's snarky. If you do, you can't return the email back. You, you provide no answers to anything because you guys are too good. You're a bunch of snooty, snobby city council people who think that, that uh, you know, your crap smells like roses, that you're wonderful, you self-congratulate each other. You, you can't handle the criticism. Half of you people hang, 
you don't even stay on the call when Paul or I are on because you can't handle the criticism. You guys are weak, and there's a reason why this city is terrible. There's a reason why there's potholes everywhere. There's a reason why crime run, run, runs rampant because all you're doing is justifying your existence and protecting your pay and protecting the pay. Okay, thank you. Next speaker, Tessa Woodmancy. Well, that's why, you know, for all the above reasons that people are saying that the politicians cannot solve our problems because their salary is on the line. And that's what Upton Sinclair said. A man can't understand um, the problems when, you know, when his paycheck is attached to it. And also, um, anyway, Paul, I forget his name, but anyway, uh, there's another guy who said it too. But anyway, basically, we, that's why we need to put it in the, uh, the charter of what we're doing because we are at the end of our uh, end of our rope where you know this is this is it this is the end game and so we have no choice but to put it in the charter that our actions in terms of climate our climate actions and resiliency resiliency needs to be the, the priority is taking care of the people and that is that is true equity when we talk about equity it's caring for the people and 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 the basic needs and we have to do that and and we have to provide food production learning learning you teach a man to fish, he will never be hungry. You teach a man to grow food, he will never be hungry. Thank you, and our last speaker will be Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. To get to my public comment. Uh, uh, you know, I hope you could really work on the uh, city public website uh, search engine. Uh, it's really confusing people, it's bugging people. Let's figure our hopes and good ideals at this time. As I've been trying to offer all week a reminder, uh, and then I hope you can pass along to other council persons, that open democratic practices are some of our better, more positive ideals and efforts. And that can very much help San Jose and the VTA at this time, who have obviously closed uh, into a more secretive, defensive, opaque war room type practices since the events of May 26 at the VTA light rail maintenance yard. This could be an important fall to rediscover our humanity as good guidelines and open democratic practices. For as much as uh, Mayor Licardo and uh, Supervisor Simidian do have a good point at this time, uh, I, you know, with, with Sheriff uh, Smith, I, it's more than law enforcement at this time, it's ourselves. We have to. All right, thank you very much. And that uh, our meeting is adjourned.